All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County uh, Board of Education meeting for April 12th, 2023. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, we've everybody had a chance to review closed session agenda items, and we have a notice or a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as submitted. Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County will meet in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demonstration, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction. Any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals to consult with counsel and obtain legal device, advice, sorry, and to consult with staff consultants and other individuals about pending or potential litigation. All right, we had a motion to approve the agenda. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Everybody had a chance to take a look at the uh, minutes for the March 1st, 2023 closed session. Yes. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the closed session meetings for March 1st. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Approval of the minutes of March 1st, 2023 open session. Everyone's had a chance to review those. Do I have a motion? A motion to approve the March 2nd uh, open session minutes. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion is passed. Okay, um, board involvement. Would any, any board member like the, uh, like the floor? I could start. I got a list this time. It was a busy month. Um, let's see. We had a MAIB class on operating in a new age. It covered some of the activities going on in the world and how we should help things move along with as it relates to our school system. Um, participated in scenario training with Mr. Joe um, at Mattapique Elementary School. I got to attend the Ken Island Ladies Championship Basketball game at the University of Maryland. Um, we did not win, but it was a very good game, and the ladies played very well. And lastly, I know that everybody's going to be able to say something, but I also attended the awards gala on the 30th, and it was fabulous. Congratulations to all those that won um, those different categories. Beautiful pictures, too. Anyone else? I'd like to give a shout out to our local businesses. Um, about three weeks ago, my granddaughters, we took them down to Sweet Frog, and they gave us this little piece of paper where if they read a book, it's kind of like a book report, and they bring it back and they got, a, they got something for that. I just really am happy how much this community supports the school system in various ways, because we're mainly made up of small businesses, and they do a lot to support our, our school. And it's little things like that when you go to a, a uh, business and they do something like that. It ma makes your it makes your heart really feel good because they're doing it for the right reasons. Uh, I want to give and it's just not them. It's it's a lot of businesses in Queen Anne's County as we look through all our billboards and support staff and stuff like that. I attended uh, both of the musicals at uh, Ken Island Queen Anne's. Um, shout out to all you guys. They were great. Uh, me and Mark attended the uh, Future Chefs competition at Sellersville Middle School. Sid was there too <laughs> as judges. Um, and that was put on by um, Wade Shalowitz, the food operations manager. Um, the kids were really cute, and they all made all kinds of different dishes. Um, and it was a fun time. And I also attended the awards gala. Yeah, they had one uh, elementary school had, you know, one candidate uh, during that, um, the Future Chefs. And uh, it was really fun to I reiterate. It was e extreme fun to watch those kids do this. They're, they're so little in there. With these sharp knives and everything else in the kitchen and everything was safe <laughs> and uh the food was actually good and we had a winner and, and voting and all that and uh what a great pro uh, program it is um i think it's sponsored by sodexo sodexo mm -hmm. and uh and looking forward to it next year or any of the board members who didn't get to go this year okay student board members 
You guys choose who wants to go first. I can go. As always. <laughs> All right, to kick off the month of March, we had the Adams Family Musical. The opening night for the show was on Friday, March 3rd, and all six showtimes were a great turnout. Later in the month, after a few weeks of studying and reviewing, all juniors sat down to take the SAT on March 22nd. On March 23rd, we held our annual prom expo in the auditorium, where students, staff, friends, and family came out to enjoy the show filled with fun and laughter. March 29th marked the end of the quarter three grading period, and progress reports will be sent out this Friday, April 14th. Also on March 29th, we held a life after high school and job fair night where students and their parents could be informed about several topics regarding college and the application process. A large portion of this event was directed towards juniors and their parents, but students from all grades were encouraged to attend. We had about 38 businesses come out to share information and some of them even took part in on-site hiring. Spring break officially began April 3rd and ended April 10th. Over the break, we had a number of contests, including a two-day girls lacrosse tournament that went very well. And majority of this upcoming month will consist of reviewing and preparation for the upcoming AP exams in May. On April 18th, we'll be celebrating new members of the National Honor Society at the NHS induction ceremony. On April 25th, any juniors who missed the SAT on March 22nd will be able to take the assessment on campus at Canal High School. Going to, into next month on May 1st, we'll be honoring two of our seniors, Max Barbara and Allison Corbin, at the Bayside Scholar Athlete Banquet. Last but certainly not least, on behalf of the students and staff at Kenan High School, I would like to congratulate Ms. Schulte for being recognized at the Queen Anne's County Public Schools Teacher of the Year. All right. Queen Anne's County High School would like to everyone to know that, uh, or like everyone to appreciate, you know, we're coming to the end, you know, we're, <laughs> we're breaking through. We're almost at graduation, we're almost at the next year. So uh, everyone just hang on there as quarter four comes to uh, to fruition. Uh, so April 14th, progress reports will be emailed home, as Mr. Johnson said. Uh, the 15th All Shore Band Concert will be held in the Queens County High School Auditorium at 4 p.m. On the 21st, we have our prom promise activity at 9.30 a.m. It's to remind students about the dangers of junk driving, as well as just a safety talk about, you know, prom and everything that goes along with that. Uh, the 21st, as well, the Chesapeake College will be at Queens County High School from 8.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. for registration for fall semester 2023. You will need a dual enrollment registration form completed, and you can find those in the office uh, in your email. The 22nd prom will be held at Prospect Bay at 7 p.m. with the theme of Great Gatsby. The 25th National Arts Honor Society inductions will happen at 5 p.m. in the cafeteria during a showcase event of K through 12 artwork called Art Scene. On the 25th, Interact Awards Ceremony will be held at 4.30 in the cafeteria. On the 26th, there will be interest meeting for Young Explorers Club, and I believe that they're going to Europe over the next uh, two years, so that's gonna be really interesting. Um, on the 26th, the Queens County High School Talent Show will be held, sponsored by the class of 2024. On the 27th, there's a career and college signing day at 1 to 2 p.m. in the lobby, and finally, from the 27th to the 30th, the band is traveling to Williamsburg, Virginia to perform. And there is also a $20 per sign for senior graduation signs. This is a PB, no, sorry, a... Bank account? PBIS? I'm, uh, PTA. Oh, PTA. PTA fundraiser. Um, the payment is due April 26th, and orders can be placed to the order form on the newsletter for April. Thank you, Mr. Wow. Toon. All right, Dr. Sam. Yes. Well, I feel like I have to echo the board members because the gala is just such a wonderful opportunity to recognize some of our amazing staff members. And so yeah, you can't really beat that night. It's just wonderful opportunity. Um, and I have to say both of the plays were amazing. I mean, both of them were extremely entertaining. I, you know, the Adams family, just the, the um, ability for the students to have that uh, the humor in, in that part of, of it was just amazing. So um, I really enjoyed both of them extremely well. So kudos, you can pass on kudos to uh, your schools. Dr. Sprankle. All right. We're always waiting for okay, fun go. stuff. Good evening, President Schiffinelli, 
Dr. Salins, board members and executive team members for the record. I am Marcia Sprinkle. I am the assistant superintendent and it is my pleasure to present our spotlight for this month. So I'm really excited and I'm gonna get going here. Starting with Graysonville Elementary School. Graysonville Elementary School celebrated St. Patrick's Day with outside events and an egg hunt sponsored by the PE teacher and her team. The late Jamie Welch's birthday was celebrated on Pi Day, which happened to be on March 14th. Staff wore his favorite shirt, believe there is good in the world. I wanna say that again, believe there is good in the world. I think that needs to stand out. He is missed tremendously by all, but his legacy lives on at Graysonville Elementary School. So kudos to you. Mr. Welch. Next, we have Kent Island Elementary School. Lots happened last month at Kent Island Elementary School. They had the father, father figure dance, daughter dance, basket bingo, which is a great, great event that happens at schools. Students and parents and families walk away with these big baskets full of goodies. So it's an exciting time when we have basket bingo at our schools. And the school participated in the Read Across America Week. So kudos to Kent Island Elementary School. Next up, we have Mattapique Elementary School. Mattapique Elementary School's PTA sponsored a family game night. As you can see there, they had a packed house. Second graders researched famous African-Americans, which is great. And the STEM Science Fair was a huge success with over 90 projects submitted. Congratulations to our Mattapique Elementary School students for those 90 projects that were submitted. That's a lot of projects. <clears throat> Next, we want to recognize Miss Betsy Babylon, the music teacher at Settlersville Middle School with Principal Rob Watkins who were honored at the 2023 Maryland Music Educators Association Statewide Awards for Excellence at their annual conference in Baltimore for supporting the arts. So congratulations to Ms. Babylon as well as Mr. Watkins. Next up, we have Kent Island High School. Mr. Hazy's AP Environmental Science class enjoyed making environmentally friendly, sustainable food during class. The Women in Engineering Club went to Centerville and worked with a Boys Scouts troop. They talked about different types of engineers and computer engineering. Students had also had the opportunity to build structures as well. Everyone had a great time. <clears throat> Also in Kent Island High School, the theater production has done it again with another amazing musical, The Adams Family. I think Dr. Salins and Miss Bett already mentioned that. It was wonderful along with Miss Cates. It was just a joy and everyone enjoyed it. Student actors, musical performers, behind the scene workers, and of course, all of the teachers who put in hours and hours of work to make sure that musical was a success. So thank you so much. And the Lady Bucks basketball team made it to the state championship. Congratulations, Lady Bucks. Whoa. Next up, Kent Island High School again. The Eastern Shore Band Directors Association sponsored the All Shore Honor Senior and Junior Bands. Students prepared scales, solos, and sight read during their auditions, five students earned a spot. That's a big honor. National Science Honor Society Trivia Night was also held at Kent Island High School. Queen Anne's County High School. Congratulations to the students and staff at Queen Anne's High School for an extraordinary production of The Wizard of Oz. It was awesome. It was enjoyed by all who had the opportunity to attend. Last month, the Maryland General Assembly honored the 2023 
2022, excuse me, 2023 Maryland Teachers of the Year across the state. Okay, the awards gala, which was really, really a huge success. Employees of the Year winners were Outstanding Leadership Award, Mrs. Susan Walbert, Principal at Churchill Elementary School, Outstanding Student Service Award Coach was Mr. David Stricker, Coach of Queen Anne's County High School, and Outstanding Support Employee was Ms. Janelle Nash, School Assistant at Mattapeak Middle School. Outstanding Specialist Award went to Katie Kersey, Math Specialist at Centerville Elementary School, and Outstanding Bus Driver Award, Ms. Nancy King, Bus Driver of 1720. She drives for both Graysonville Elementary School and Stevensville Middle School. Congratulations to all. Next up, we have our Queen Anne's Teacher of the Year finalists. We have Kayla Karras, fifth grade teacher at Sutlersville Middle School. Thomas Heyman, seventh grade social studies teacher at Centerville Middle School. Aaron Conley, eighth grade history teacher at Mattapee Middle School. And Ms. Andrea Schulte, visual arts teacher at Kent Island High School. Congratulations to all. Ms. Andrea Schulte from Kent Island High School will go on to represent Queen Anne's County Public Schools at the state competition for Maryland's Teacher of on the Year. We are sure she will present or represent Queen Anne's County Public Schools well. So that is it for our spotlight for this month. <clears throat> That's a lot. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you as always. Okay, we're moving on to citizen participation. Ms. Bent. We ask that all speakers keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or board president if you have a specific question. The board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens to show respect for all. First name, Richard McNeil. All right, and Mr. McNeil, come on up. But before you start, let me um, just reiterate a couple things. You can sit down. We won't start the clock till I'm done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Ms. Bent um, just read the the general rules, okay, for public comment. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I understand why a lot of uh, uh, people are here tonight and want to speak. Prior to going in, uh, just when we started the meeting, if you recall, we talked about the, our board going into closed session. And we go into closed session for privacy reasons. And the reason is because we discuss personnel matters there. Um, we don't discuss personnel matters, uh, uh, whatever the matter is. We don't discuss it in open session. And there's a reason for that. So we have gotten a lot of emails, um, and we, uh, we've had a point of contact who's been responding you know, as best we can. Even when we respond, it, it make, if it concerns a personal matter, it's personal, it's confidential, we can't discuss it. So the comments tonight, or any night, uh, our policy is that it should concern a general policy. That's one element. The other one is that it is something that's in the board's hands. And there's some things that are, are not in the board's you know, purview. Um, uh, we, we don't have decision-making authority over certain things. And uh, um, if I'm, I'm reading the crowd right, this may be one of those things. So um, I'd ask everybody to be respectful. Please don't address remarks to a specific uh, uh, employee or about a specific employee. If it's a general statement, that's fine. Thank you for your patience. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ahead, um, my name is Richard McNeil. I live in Centerville on White Marsh Road, um, and I'm here representing the retired uh, school personnel. Um, I ran for election again, uh, so I'm two more years out. So right. some of you might retire and take over for me. So I'm um, 
At our March meeting, I want to let everybody know that we had a representative from Retirement First and Blue Cross and Blue Shield to answer questions and concerns about our uh, health policy. And that resulted in some really good conversations. And mostly what it was, is we were used to having to use a card and a supplement card for the insurance. And then in January, when we went over, it went to just one card. And that created uh, a, a lot of confusion among our, our retirees and for some of the medical people that we were seeing. But the folks from Blue Cross and Blue Shield and our liaison from retirement did a wonderful job of explaining that. So I uh, want to say thanks to that. Um, from our organization, we want to also say thanks to or congratulations to Dr. Salen for uh, Superintendent of the Year. Uh, that comes from your colleagues, and uh, it's well represented that way, and we appreciate that. We also want to say congratulations to the Teacher of the Year and all the employees. Uh, we sponsor that. Um, and as Mr. Smith said, you know, there's a shout out to businesses to do that. Well, there's, there's a shout out to a lot of teachers who are doing things behind the scenes. Um, great talent doesn't come out either on the sports field or uh, on the stage without a teacher behind that. And uh, I think it's coming up, uh, art, art scene is coming up, I think, in April. I'm not sure um, at the different schools. And I encourage the community to come out and see the skills and talents uh, of the art students. And again, that is pushed by the art teachers and the instructors in all of the schools who are doing that uh, in that part. Um, also want to let folks know that the retirement uh, group offers two scholarships. So if anybody listening or on the board, if you know of somebody who is graduating and going into uh, the field of education, uh, $2,000 doesn't sound like much, but uh, we had a hard time getting applications last year. Uh, we had to go and really almost beg uh, folks to apply for it. And I know a lot of it's done through Naviance and on the computer. So counselors themselves don't really know who's, who's applying. But if anybody's listening or if you know somebody who's going into that, I would encourage you to um, to apply. Uh, it's a very simple application uh, for that part. Um, and again, uh, we, we appreciate uh, our cooperation that we have with HR. Uh, I know the school year is uh, coming down to an end. I saw an ad where it's in the fourth quarter and, and the goal line is coming up. Um, as people get ready to retire, we appreciate that information. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Raven Bishop. Do you have to push anything? No, ma'am. After you state your name and address, I'll start it for you. Raven Bishop, Churchill. Um, I'm here today to express concerns about revisions to policy 607. Uh, the revisions in that policy rather conspicuously remove uh, multicultural education. And where I recognize that that may be in response to COMAR 13A, which changes multicultural education to education that is equitable or equitable education, what I find alarming is that the language surrounding multicultural education is not replaced with language surrounding equity. In fact, the only time equity is mentioned in the document as it stands now is tied to UDL and where UDL is a framework that can support diverse learners. It is not a replacement for multicultural education. So as a parent and as somebody who cares about multicultural education and diversity and equity within our curriculum and in our policies, I'm quite concerned. The fact of the matter is that multiculturalism and intersectionality is something that's baked into our American experience. And no policy revision is going to change that it's a part of the lived experience of our faculty, students, and staff, and community members. And I feel that then what we are charged with as a community and as educators is to create learning experiences which affirm and represent and educate students about that multicultural and intersectional experience that we're all living in this country. So I'll be listening intently tonight to understand how the removal of multicultural education from this policy language does that. I want to know how that, the removal of that language supports our students in understanding and engaging in conversations about multiculturalism and intersectionality and how it 
um, supports and um, and uh, educates our students to remove this language. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Cliff Donaldson. Hello. Uh, my name is Cliff Donaldson, Sudlersville, Maryland, um, and I am here on behalf of Queen Anne's County High School football program. I know that there are possibly some changes coming down the line and what I would like to do tonight is just give you a little background so that when you're making your decisions you have a clear picture of all sides of what's happening. Um, first thing I want to tell you is a little bit about myself. I have three boys. One of them graduated from Queen Anne's County High School, went to Penn State, got a degree, got his uh, bachelor's degree in history and uh, actually wanted to be a teacher and then COVID broke out. So now he's working for me. Uh, so I actually won on that one. But uh, I have two other sons and they did not go to Queen Anne's County High School. And the reason was they were very good athletes and there was not a program in place that was going to allow them. I was actually told by the previous program that their job was to win, not necessarily get kids to college. Well. As a parent, I want my kids to do better than I have in, in life. So I ended up taking those boys two hours away so that they could go to DeMatha High School where they both played football and they both earned scholarships for college. Uh, one of them is in the Air Force, is gonna, he's training to be a fighter pilot and a lieutenant right now. And then the second one is playing at Frostburg University right now and uh, getting, his, <clears throat> excuse me, getting his degree in business management. Um, so why did I do that? I did that because I wanted things for my kids. And when I joined this program recently, um, we wanted to, to really emphasize on how to help these kids be better human beings, be better people, and be able to go get a college education, even the ones that can't afford it. And that was the whole goal of the program. Still to this day, that's the goal of the program. That's why we're here today is to enlighten you on how we're helping them accomplish those things. We have set up many uh, uh, coaches to come into the schools so that they can meet these fine young men. We've worked on GPA grades so that they can understand uh, that how important that is. We've worked on teaching them how to take their SATs and their ACTs at often and early because they can super score for the schools that still take it. We have schools like Brown and we have schools like Princeton and we have schools like uh, Duke and Rutgers and Temple. And I mean, you name it, we've got, we've got all three academies that have visited our schools. That's what we're doing with this program. And before you make a decision that's gonna be detrimental to all of those kids in this community, and I'm not just talking about the high school kids, I'm talking about the parents that are looking at it like I did. Before you make that decision, please consider all of those things. That's what we ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Malone Grace. Malone Grace Centerville. Uh, I'm a student and football player at Queen Anne's County High School. And I want to talk about what my coaches have done for me outside of football. Last year at around this time, I had, didn't really have a plan to go to college and I had a 1.7 GPA. And my coach pulled me aside and talked to me about how important education is and what college can do for you. And I now have a 4.0 GPA looking at, I'm going on college visits, looking at colleges, going to college football camps and hoping to do something with that. And I wouldn't be doing any of that right now if my coach hadn't talked to me about it and helped me through that. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Denise Banning. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. My name is Denise Banning. I'm also with 
Queen Anne's County High School football. Um, I have two students in the school. My son is going to be a senior next year. Um, I have a lot of details, which I've sent everyone the emails, you know, and which I won't go into as we, as we discussed. Um, but I did want to piggyback on what was said already. Um, this is so much more than a football team. You know, the opportunities that this program has been built to be is amazing. And it's all because of one person, you know, I'm no names, whatever, but one person. This is so much more than these boys going out on the field. Our average grade point average for the varsity team last year was 3.67. That's amazing. These, you know, amazing. They're out there six days a week playing. 3.67. Why? Because education is number one. You know, it's not football. Yeah, do we want a good program? Of course. But that's so, so important. Um, the motto since joining this, you know, and, and learning with the, playing with these coaches and it's we let's make a difference. This is the exact words. We only have these kids for a few years. Let's see where they can go. And I don't believe that that has been seen because it's not gloated about, you know, or anything like that. But that's what our program's about. It's so much more than football. Um, we have one of my main issues, um, which like I said, I have a lot of details here, you know, which if anybody didn't get the email, I'd be happy to send it again, um, is when all this was going down, I really wish we would have had some guidance. You know, like my email that I sent was pretty much what I was gonna read tonight. And I wasn't asking for details on a, you know, a certain employee or anything. And I just got the form email back saying I can't give details. That's not what it was about. How about I mean, just some guidance? You know, my kids are in the school systems, help me. And I was getting nothing back. And I'm talking from the principal also. You know, I, I did call him, I talked to him the day everything happened. I've asked for a meeting, I've get nothing back. We need some guidance. I wasn't getting anything. I know it was spring break and that was tough and everything too. But once I sent an email to the state board, I got a call today from someone at Queen Anne's County, you know, which was very helpful and helped me, you know, with this. We need some guidance. This is, it's not fair, you know. Thank goodness my kids have been in Queen, Anne, Queen Anne's County schools <clears throat> their whole life, and this is my first time here. I've never had to email a superintendent. You know, this is my first time, you know, and that's not fair. We have no support as, you know, as families and team, and we, they felt like they were dropped. Things like this were, I, I feel, or you know, it's premeditated. The timing was premeditated. Our spring break was nothing but these boys being upset. And that's not fair. Right, and we you. have a lot more questions, and, but if somebody can guide me of where I can get some answers, because I'm not getting them from board, I'm not getting them from a principal. All right, thank you. Jason McDonald. Yeah, either one. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jason McDonald. I represent uh, Upper Queen Anne's County Youth Football Program as a whole. Every year we get the privilege to serve approximately 200 youth from surrounding elementary schools and middle schools in the Queen Anne's County High School District and the Ken Island High School District. Over the last year, we have forged a relationship with the Queen Anne's County High School football program. They have volunteered their time, not only the staff, but the players as well, to come down and mentor our youth. That would not have been done without the leadership that's currently at the football program. They are pushing their knowledge as professional coaches down to the youth level coaches to help us train these children better to become better football players and better student athletes as a whole. Uh, I have a very limited knowledge on the policies uh, of hiring practices within the athletic department. The only knowledge I do have comes from a 2018, 2019 version of an athletic handbook that's publicly accessible on the website. So while I do know that current educators and certified personnel 
have first dibs at all coaching opportunities, I would ask that in the event that we are allowed to get an emergency coaching staff, that with preference, we give the opportunity to the current staff in place. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Klein. Good evening and hello again. I'm going to break it up a little bit and talk about books for a minute. Uh, my name is Kim Klein and I reside at 200 Elm Street in Centerville, Maryland. I have two children that attend Kennard Elementary School and I am talking about policy 620.1 and 620. Um, the policy itself is titled Materials of Instruction and these are classified as materials that support teaching and learning according to the policy itself. Free choice reading materials do not fit into this category. We have been told this is not a new policy or a reinterpretation, but nowhere does it mention a teacher's personal classroom library consists only of a few board approved books. It appears as though a few certain people have taken liberties to interpret this policy as they see fit due to an instance that occurred that created concern according to Ms. Passon at the last meeting. What was this concern and why can't it be addressed individually? Why remove all books because of one instance? Why punish all students because of one concern? I don't like my children reading graphic novels, but I'm not gonna demand that my children's teachers remove all graphic novels from their classroom libraries and prevent other children who enjoy those kind of books from having access to them. And like I said at the last meeting, free choice reading is used as a reward for students who finish their work early, but it also teaches patience and self-control while they wait for their fellow classmates to finish their work. I would rather my child read a book that, I'm sorry, I would rather my child read a book than be given busy work or be told to get on the, on the computer just to spare some time. Let them have an enjoyable brain break for a few minutes during the day. There is no way for teachers to instruct a portion of the class that have finished their work, so there needs to be other options, and allowing children to read a book of their choosing is the best choice. Having only a handful of board-approved books on the shelf is not going to work. We are doing our children a huge disservice by putting so much regulation on them. They won't be prepared when they go out into the real world, real world to make their own choices. I trust my children's teachers to have good judgment and offer age appropriate reading materials. If I have an issue with a book in the classroom, I'll contact that teacher directly. This has gone to an extreme and it's not necessary. I respectfully ask that you allow teachers to keep a wide range of free choice reading materials in their classroom libraries and allow students the opportunity to make their own choices. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria Navazio. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Victoria Navazio. Um, I live in Centerville. I'm here also to speak about the, the football program and the recent changes in it that have most of us upset. Um, I will tell you that I actually did not want my son to play football. I was actually firmly against it. Um, I was worried about injury and his long-term health and what would that mean to his future. Um, he was pretty adamant about playing. His father wanted him to play and his mother wanted him to play. I'm, I'm the stepmother. Um, so I said, okay, you know, we'll see how it goes. But once, I, once he joined the program and I saw what they were doing with the program, I was actually very impressed. Um, I was impressed that they didn't treat these kids just as football players, and they weren't interested in, in them as just as athletes and them winning. They really were interested in them as individuals and well-rounded individuals and their academics being first. I heard it many times for them that their academics had to be first and that they wanted them to focus on academics um, and even working together with their other 
you know, their other teammates, if they knew somebody was struggling, you know, to help each other out. So they were teaching, you know, responsibility, accountability, looking out for your fellow teammates, and then having them being involved in some volunteer work. So those kinds of things actually resonated with me as an individual and as a parent and what I want for my son for his future and the kind of adult I want him to be. And so I support him fully now to play football and to be a part of this team. And so to see this change is actually upsetting because it speaks to the change that can happen to this program without much consideration of how it's going to affect the players and how it's going to you know, um, ripple into them in their future. So it, it is quite upsetting. And it is upsetting, as, as uh, Ms. Benning said, that you know, we really weren't given much information on, on what influence or consideration we as parents could have to affect a change because these are our kids and we do care about what is going to happen to them. They're not just football players. It's not just about the football team. It's about these kids as well. So we care deeply about what's going to happen to this team, to these football players that happen to be our kids and how well-rounded they were looked out for. Um, it's just really important to us that some consideration should be given to that position and the individual that was in it, not mentioning any names, um, that you know, really helped to inspire how that program was ran. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. John Mayoral. My name is John Mayero, and um, I'm the other half of the stepmom that was just up here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a tough act to follow because I cannot speak as eloquently as she can. I just have a few things to say. You know, my son, watching how he's changed, you know, during this season and last season with the, with the guidance of the current staff there is incredible. Um, the gentleman earlier said that we want our children to be better than what we, we are or how we, opportunities we may have had. He's already surpassed anything that I've ever accomplished. I didn't have the opportunities that he is getting and, um, and being pushed to, to, to achieve. Um, I've seen the change in him. He's, he's excited when he sees his school grades. Um, you know, and I attribute that to being pushed by the coaches um, to better himself. Um, I don't know. That's, I'm nervous. That's about all I have to say. But I did, I did want to say one last thing. Mr. Smith mentioned something about what you saw down at, at Sweet Frog, the little reward program, so to speak. Well, these boys have their reward program in their coach. Their, their coach rewards them in the sense that he helps them, he pushes them, and, and, and they get the benefit of, of learning and, and how to become better young men. So that's all I have. All right, thank, thank, you. thank you. Kimberly Molesky. Good evening, my name is Kimberly Molesky and I'm from Centerville. I'm here to speak of the concern at the high school, Queen Anne's High School. I feel if the board decides to terminate a contract of a coach, it would have a huge disservice to the student athletes of the football team and their emotional health. And I think that we've already been through so much. Emotionally, 
And physically, these children rely on the coach's wisdom in trying to navigate life's challenges. And they truly are a family. It's more than a football team. It's more than the score on the scoreboard. If the decision has a negative outcome, it will also have a negative impact on these student athletes and our community as a whole. I ask that you really consider all of the information that we have submitted to you on behalf of our coach. I am, in closing, I would like to say that I am a little dissatisfied by the response that I have received. Um, I've had questions unrelated to a personnel matter and they were not answered. And to me, I feel that's not really acceptable. We take the time to reach out. We don't have a lot of information. We're looking for guidance. We're looking for help. We've asked questions and we haven't received answers. Um, so I had hoped for more. I wanted to thank you for your time this evening and thank you for listening to my comments. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Christina Woodward. Either one. Hi, everybody. I'm a mom. My name's Christina Woodward. I have two sons on the football team. I'm part of the QA football boosters. And I also am part of the UQA board for the tackle football. Um, I'm going to read off of this because I don't want to get too emotional, but this coach has done so much for my kids, not on the football field, it's off. The main part that he's done, main thing he's done for mine is off the field. My older son, he battled with depression for a long time. He was seeing a therapist on a weekly basis. Eventually went to monthly after he started with weight training with this coach and went on in the summer with the, the um, lifting that he was doing and then joining this team. His mental health, it really wasn't improving the way we were hoping. And we wanted him to leave his room. He wanted to get out of his room and not feel the way he was feeling. He didn't want to spend time with his friends. He didn't even want to come out and spend time with his family. His therapist encouraged him to join programs at the school, which he did in the winter of 21 with weightlifting. He has learned so much from this coach. My son's confidence in himself began to improve. He started to talk to new people, spending time with our family. He was leaving his room. This coach, is the person who impacted him the most. He continuously told him how well he was doing. He also encouraged him to come out to play on the actual football team. My son was hesitant at first with his lack of confidence in himself, but this coach convinced him enough and he gave it a try. He joined the summer program, like I said, and my son eventually joined the football program. And because of that bond that he has made with this coach, it's it's continued to something he never he never knew he was missing in his life. I mean, it was something he wanted. He just didn't know he he wanted it. He's now part of this this team, this family at the the football program. He's learned what it feels like during the highs with them and during the lows. He is not a shell of himself anymore. We have our son back because of this coach and the program that he's developed. I, I, my son smiles and he's happy again. He's happy to be there with this team. And not only that, my other son, the younger one, he's had some issues from an injury during one of the games this year where our doctors and emergency, sorry, emergency rooms failed. This coach stepped up. And he helped us find a therapist who found out what was truly wrong with him. And he's now getting treatment. This coach, it's, he doesn't just stay on the field. He's with us all year long. Thank you. All right, and I thank hope you, you take you. that into consideration. Thank you.
Raheem Roy. Uh, my name is Jaheem Roy. I'm a junior at Queen Anne's County High School, and I'm here to talk about uh, the coach's situation. But I just wanted to talk about how this coach helps us out on and off the field. I mean, everybody will see the score Friday night or our winning record, but nobody will notice all through that week how it pushes us in the classroom, make sure we talk to adults and retreat every, or respect everybody and treat everyone with respect. Things like yes, saying yes instead of yeah, or nah, saying no, yes sir, stuff like that. Also helping with GPA and in the classrooms. I know a lot of players struggled with grades and GPA going into the seasons, but with him being around, helping us all the way through the year, he's not just a football coach. He's more of a family type person to us, where he's with us all through the year, helping no matter what. And I would also like to talk about how he helps us with the next level. I know me personally, I'm being heavily recruited right now. I have seven full ride division one offers, but also there's four seniors out of the four seniors that wanted to play football, all four seniors made it to the next level with help from Coach Al. And he makes this program more of a family, not just a football coach. It's not like we see him during football season and we'll never see him again. He's here for us all, like, all year around, no matter what's going on. And then I also wanted to talk about how right now there's a lot going on with recruiting, and this is the biggest time for all like high school athletes to be recruited, especially with the class of 2024. I know there's three schools waiting just to see how this situation blows over to meet with our players and coaches. So I was wondering how that would work out. And also he, how much attention he brings to the school for everybody. He'll get people from JUCO to division one, no matter where you fit. And it's constant help, but also on the field, he'll always make us a better player, stronger, Things like that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. George Harrison. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name's my name's uh, George Harrison. Uh, I live in Greensboro, Maryland, which is actually in Caroline County. Um, I'm a volunteer coach for the Queen Anne's football program. Um, I did it start about five years ago um, under uh, a different coaching regime. And uh, once uh, that regime ended, I was asked if I wanted to stay on this one. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a big, it's a big thing for me because, I mean, I drive, you know, 35 minutes to get here, um, you know, tonight alone. But, you know the sacrifice and time for a lot of the a lot of the coaches on the program um, are volunteer, um, and 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 it's like I said, it's, uh, piggybacking off everybody that said stuff here tonight um, is it's it's about the kids. Um, you know, we, it, it's a lot of time, a lot of sacrifice. It's not you know on paper or or, or, or on the books or, or on video or anything else. You know what in the world we live in, but. Um, it's it's a uh, it's it's really it, it's a big it's a big difference um, you know when when there's actual leadership and 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 going forward more than just football as, as everybody's already said um, but um, you know I, I had you know I could I could be coaching over at North Carolina where I played when I played in high school but um, you know I, I actually turned down offers to do that to stay at this coaching staff because I believe in this coaching staff and. And this, this, you know, this school, honestly, um, you know, and, and and as as of late, I mean that, you know, just the school per se, but um, you know, the football program's really done a good job. Um, and you know, like I said, I, I don't I don't get anything out of this, but the enjoyment and the responsibility of creating these young men into into great young men. That's what we do. Um, you know, like I said, Friday night's just a part of it. It goes, you know, I'm out. I get off work. My, one of my bosses is here tonight. Um, you know, he he's, he actually asked me to, about the football program, getting involved. He's like, you know, is is, is you know, how, how's how's the program? You know, and he's like, yeah, you think I can come out and help? Because because he can see what we're doing. We're we're, we're about the kids, um, and that's where it starts. So um, that's about what I got to say. Um, and thank you for taking my time.
not going to butcher this last name. First name is Chad. I apologize. Okay. German names are like that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Chad Dieterichs. I'm a parent of three children that are currently in the Queen Anne's County School System, and I'm here tonight to comment on an email reportedly sent to middle and high school teachers over a month ago, instructing them not to allow students to read non-board approved books during the school day. There are also unconfirmed reports of investigations into some classroom bookshelves in an attempt to catalog and potentially police the content of classroom libraries. It is disturbing to hear that anyone associated with the Queen Anne's County School System would be taking any actions with the intent of discouraging independent free reading in any way. If these accounts are inaccurate, that would be a great relief. But either way, it should be noted that teachers have always been allowed to have bookshelves stocked with various books for independent reading. Independent reading at a young age leads to a lifetime love of reading. Teachers' classroom bookshelves have long been the repository of free reading books that are not required to be explicitly named on the approved book list. Policy 620 and 620.1 refer only to instruct instructional content, and nothing more. Free choice reading options are not instructional content, and so therefore should not fall under this policy. Classroom free reading libraries should remain in their current form, free of interference and not subjected to any perceived political agendas. Thank you. Thank All right, you. thank you. It was the last on our list. Okay. All right, that's it for public comment. Is there anyone else that was not signed up or that was signed up and, and didn't get a chance to speak? All right. Information items, 5.01, Everside yes. update. Good evening, President Schiffinelli, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. My name is Jane Towers. I'm here tonight with Stuart Sutley. He is the partner with at Bolton Partners, and he's going to present an update for Everside for us. I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint now. Great. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, good to see some of you again. From It was uh, about 10 months ago last year, so last June, that we actually were here to, to have a vote to move forward with this health center. And I'm here really tonight just to give an update on the status and, and the opportunity as it's uh, finally coming to, to fruition. So a little bit about Everside Health, which is the vendor that was selected to open a direct primary care health center here in Centerville for the employees and dependents of both the school and the county together, so collectively. Um, Everside is a national company. They've been really growing in these last couple of years, especially with schools and counties across the United States. And they really deliver comprehensive primary care and mental health support for employees and their dependents within an organization. So this is a really great opportunity. It's a great opportunity really for the employees and dependents because there is no cost to use this health center for the employees and dependents. So this is uh, free access to direct primary care and mental health. And I think one of the real benefits about this is the fact that many of us know it's becoming harder and harder to find good primary care support today because there's not as many doctors out there that many are retiring, and also the wait times. So one of the nice things about this model is this is same day or next day access for this support. So again, as a refresher, there are a lot of services that will be available in this health center. Again, being able to have a, your own primary care physician, um, being able to go in for kind of urgent care needs, uh, medications if needed, Mental health support, obviously very important today. Getting your labs done in one place. So it really becomes a, a great place for convenience. And when you look at the opportunities for families, well, we've got a client that last August did 189 back to school physicals in the month of July because everybody forgot to get the back to school physicals. So um, when you look at, again, some of the benefits that we believe this will bring, this will only, not only help with, you know, overall better management of healthcare costs within the school and the county, but also I really think be a, a wonderful benefit. 
This will be open to all full-time employees of both the school and the county. All dependents, ages two and up, who are on covered by the health plan, and also retirees who are on the health plan within the school. So again, really open access that we think will be well received. And, and really, what's, what's the opportunity here? I, I think really it's all about you know, the opportunity to be healthier. We all have busy schedules today. It's hard to get access. It's hard to have the time. So many of this, much of this is around minimizing that wait time and making these services available. Again, the visits are free and everybody will have their own dedicated physician um, or care provider that will help them again, better manage their health as they continue through the, the journey of, of being employed within the county and the school itself. Uh, a couple things, this question always gets asked. Looks like that didn't come through all the way. There was a title there that says, what if I have my own primary care physician? Um, if you already have one, this is not, you need to give up your existing physician relationship and just use Everside. So many times we'll find that people do have a good relationship with a doctor, but you know what? It's hard to get to them. It's hard to get their schedule when you need to. Uh, there might be a copay. Uh, it might be across town. So even though you may have a doctor, you can still continue to use this health center for a lot of your regular needs. Um, you can also, with permission, have the Everside clinician work with your physician to better manage your care if you're on some type of care plan. So we really see this as a great way to kind of coordinate better services and have great access, again, on, on an ongoing basis. And I want to hit on an important piece about what services are there. Again, it's not just, um, again, your urgent care or primary care. There's you know, flu shots, vaccinations, medications, lab work. So again, when you think about the time and convenience, it's, it's pretty significant. Uh, so another question that always comes up and we wanna reemphasize this is that this is just like having your own provider. The, your information's confidential. These types of companies would not be in business if they ever shared personal confidential information about an employee or a dependent. Um, and again, when you look at the ability to be able to work within the community and get referred to specialists, working with your own primary care physician to help you really manage all of that back and forth is significant. There's easy access. So even though the health center, we'll show this on the last slide, is open on certain hours of the week, uh, there is 24 seven access through virtual care. So people will be able to, through the app, um, be able to set an appointment. They can get a hold of one of the providers over the weekend if need be, um, and do quite a bit on the app, including not only setting your appointments, but also looking at your lab results, um, requesting prescription refills, et cetera, all from one easy place. Uh, we've got a great location right here in Centerville. Um, the address, 2977 4H Park Road, right, I guess everybody says right near the 7-Eleven. So, um, so everybody knows where 7-Eleven is. So right there, it's, um, the, the construction is, should be finished um, by the end of this month, early May. Um, we are getting through some of the hiring process, been a little challenging on the hiring. It is everywhere right now but we've got a uh, really great um, first two hires to be staffing the center. And you see the hours of operation there. The hours are staggered so that some people can have early morning access, later afternoon access, et cetera. So we wanna make this as flexible as possible. So the, the, uh, finally, the goal is that this will be you know, up and running um, really as the new school year begins. Um, it'd be a great time to get all faculty and staff and their dependents engaged in it when they come back from summer break and really looking forward to the opportunity. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions? How can our retirees find, because we have them retiring in the southern states, Florida and some other ones, how they find other locations? Because even if you're traveling as an employee, you could stop by one of these areas. Is there an, on that app, does that tell you where they are and things like that? Uh, yes, sir. So, so good question. So one of the nice things about this vendor that we're working with is they do have uh, hundreds of locations across the country and expanding and you can go to any one of their facilities. Um, so for example, they have one in 
um, outside of Fort Lauderdale. So somebody's retired down there, they can go in and actually there is a location finder and you can find the one closest to you. And then they'll have a record that you are a member uh, attributed to Everside and you can go access it through that. There's also a call in line, sir. So there's also a, a phone number to call if somebody doesn't want to use the apps, not comfortable with it, they can call and also get assistance. I think it was somewhere it might be in your presentation. There's 385 locations in 34 states. So I'm assuming it's a mis Western mis East Coast thing more. Is that? Um, the, the, the vast majority are on the East Coast, although they've got a good presence in Colorado and a couple of states. But their, their biggest growth right now is, is basically Pennsylvania, down through the Carolinas and into Florida is where they're seeing the significant growth. That's great. No, I think it's awesome. Very Thank you. And, very and Dr. Salins from Office of Bolton, again, congratulations on your yeah. award. Thank you what a much. better thing than to have a new health center and we've got the, the best <laughs> superintendent in the state. So it's a thank great you. thing. Thank so great. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Do you guys mind if we just dismiss the... Oh, no, everybody. Uh, please yeah, do. Anytime. Oh, thank no. you for that. That's very polite. Thank you. All right, have a good night. Yeah, right. Yeah. Thank you. See you. You're all right. I should be on there. There go all our cookies and cokes. Yeah. <laughs> I can put it right here. Really I have it on here. Them. Grab them, man. You can grab some. Right, grab, grab, grab them all. We're not going to. Eat them. Go right ahead. I'm, I'm <clears> we don't need them. You can take them, really. <laughs> They're good. You're too dirty. Yeah, you stuff right there. All right. Good evening, President Schiffinelli, Superintendent. Board members, for the record, my name is Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer, and with me tonight I have Mr. Jeremy Klein from WJG, I'm sorry, WGM Architecture and Interiors, and we wanted to give you an update um, tonight so, on the new board um, process. Sorry, I pulled it All right. Out. Welcome. Sorry. We've done a number of public meetings. I just pulled up the wrong one. So, oh. so here we go. All right. Well, thank you uh, for having us back today. Again, we've uh, done this every couple of months with you to give you an, an update on what's going on with the new central office building um, for, the, for the Board of Education. So since we last met right at the beginning of February, we've hit a couple of important uh, milestones. We had a Board of Appeals meeting in early February. We had an informational meeting with the Planning Commission, Centerville Planning Commission um, in mid-March. And I'm gonna most focus on, on what we showed that group and the feedback that we got um, from them. Uh, a really important upcoming milestone is we meet again with the Planning Commission in mid-May, and it's at that point that we're asking for formal approval of our site development uh, package. Um, based on the feedback that we've received so far, we've been to them twice already. Uh, we are hopeful that it's a first time around approval, but, but we'll see how, how that goes. Um, along with the site development, we have also been uh, focusing on the development inside the building, and that's meeting with all of the departments um, as as we continue to uh, sort of flesh out those spaces and further develop those spaces. We've gotten great feedback from, from all the staff. Um, people are very passionate about their jobs, and they know the types of spaces that will work best uh, for them. Um, and I think everybody has started to understand the overall framework of the building. Um, where they're located within the building and, and um, how we can best design those spaces to meet their needs. Um, by way of brief overview, I'm not gonna do the, the same presentation that, that I've given you a couple times before, but to orient people who may not have seen it before, the site of the new central office building um, <clears throat> is directly across the street from Queen Anne's County High School. 
Uh, it's in this sort of institutional complex that's growing up on the edge of town. The Queen Anne's County office building is just across Vincent Street to the west, and the YMCA is, is currently under construction to the south of the site. Um, I mentioned to you before when we initially <clears throat> submitted to the Planning Commission and to the Town Advisory uh, Committee, some preliminary feedback was that we needed to shift the building uh, footprint a little bit to the south and the west. On this slide, the old building location was shown in red. The current building location is shown in black. The only other thing I'll point out here on the, um, on the site slide, that dashed line that you see going across the middle of the site is a um, <clears throat> split zoning line, which means that a portion of the site is in the R2 zone. Uh, that is the reason we needed to go make a submission to the Board of Appeals. A governmental office building is uh, an allowable use via special exception in the R2 zone, uh, but you do have to make that application for special exception. Here's the current site plan as it exists now, uh, not dramatically different at all in terms of uh, location or layout um, from what you've previously seen. Um, the site plan, we've started to develop some of the site furnishings, um, some of the uh, equipment and accessories that support the building, so dumpster enclosures, um, emergency generator enclosure, um, started to develop the landscaping plan a little more, et cetera. So we did um, get our verbal opinion from the Board of Appeals on February 7th, but you can see from the date at the bottom of the letter, just two days ago, we actually received the written opinion uh, from the Board of Appeals, which was a favorable opinion granting uh, the special exception. So that's um, a checkbox for, for the building uh, in, in moving past that step. Again, I talked about development on the, on the interior of the building, each of these different um, colors that you see on the floor plan is a different department. I think at this point you've all seen the video I've shown in some previous things about sort of the development of the building, how that grew out of the program, um, where the building size comes from, um, essentially each of these uh, units being a departmental area, um, all coalesced around the center, uh, the central meeting room, which will be the, you know, uh, akin to the room that we're, that we're in now, um, in the center of the building, uh, in the more, the more public space. Uh, the, the yellow areas here are sort of the shared collaborative spaces. So again, uh, the boardroom being the largest central meeting space, the other areas in yellow being conference rooms spread throughout the building of various sizes that will be available to all the departments. That's one of the things that lets us get the efficiency to take from a 48,000 square foot building that we're sitting in now down to a 34,000 square foot building um, uh, and actually design it even for uh, expansion over the, over the current staff. Um, blue are the restrooms, again, located on both sides of the building uh, for easy access for all the occupants. I don't think uh, I've shown this slide before, but it's another way I have, uh, we've talked about the volumes and how, how this building is a, a volumetric building. Um, these sort of little cubes that open up to the north to allow diffuse daylight into the spaces. So the areas in purple that you see are areas that would have an open uh, high ceiling, basically open to the structure above. Those uh, translucent fiberglass panels would let that diffuse daylight in. Most of the open office areas that are more defined by systems furniture rather than hard partition walls would be located in those areas. Again, that's a real short-term flexibility, being able to adapt and adjust to different, um, different occupant needs, but also allowing access to natural daylight to all the building occupants, um, which is such, a, such an important thing for uh, productivity and, and morale. Um, <clears throat> I, I think we made this point before, but you can see that the, the shape and the form of this building, it's a perimeter heavy building, right? So for the area of the building, it's intentionally been designed with a lot of perimeter. That's to allow access to natural daylight views, a lot of, a lot of natural views. Um, so when we initially met with the planning commission, they had asked us to come back in March. Um, 
they saw the similar video that you saw, and th this doesn't look like a lot of office buildings that people have seen before. So they were very interested in uh, hearing us explain the relationship of the building to its context, and specifically the context of Centerville. So we went back and we thought a lot about the context and what we were <clears throat> drawing from. And we kind of came that we, we feel like this building is primarily influenced by three main contexts, right? So there's the institutional architecture of Centerville. And I think uh, we're all familiar with that. So we have some photos here of the historic bank building dip downtown. We have, we have the building that we're sitting in. These are both older, older buildings. They don't look exactly the same, but they've got some similarities. There are newer institutional buildings in Centerville, whether it's the Liberty Building from a, a few decades ago or whether it's the very recently constructed uh, district court. So what's the common theme in these Centerville institutional buildings? It's, it's red brick. It's red brick and it's a real um, primacy of red brick on the facade. So the roof lines may be a little different. Some of the forms are more traditional than others, but institutional buildings in Centerville have a lot of red brick. Okay, then we have the second context and that's our immediate site context. So these are the three immediate neighbors of our buildings. So there's uh, Queen Anne's County High School, there is the county office building across the street, and there's the YMCA, which is under construction to the south. So again, these are institutional buildings, a bit more contemporary than maybe what we um, saw in the previous slides. Uh, you see more use of uh, more copious amounts of glazing, continuous glazing, maybe rather than punched windows, you still see some red brick. Uh, on the high school and on, and on the county office building. Um, but the, these are the immediate neighbors. I think the third context, as we thought about it, is really the one that resonates with us the most and the one that we think that this building draws from the most. And that is the more uh, regional context of the sort of agrarian nature of the buildings all around Centerville, all around the county that you see. Uh, the agricultural buildings. So, you know, these, these barns, these collections of buildings, and these read across the landscape as really volumes, simple volumes. They might have gables, they might have shed roofs. You see a lot of them with monoslope shed roofs, uh, but they're collections of buildings in the landscape. Little more close up view here. You know, from a material standpoint, a lot of standing seam metal roofs, and then the barns primarily with a kind of vertical siding. In this case, it's wood, and in many cases, it's wood. It, it may be metal. Um, but as we thought about our building, this, this seemed to be the context, context that, that resonated the most with us. So some of our contemporaries have clearly drawn off of that same context. This is the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Visitor Center in Church Creek, Maryland. We are big fans of this uh, building. Clearly they're drawing, it's not a building we did, I can't take credit for it, but we think it's a great building. Um, clearly they're drawing off of the uh, agrarian influence that's all around the area, um, but reinterpreting in a different way. These are you look at these across the landscape and these are barns, but the materiality and certainly in this case, sort of the window arrangement, that's much more about the experience of that visitor center and the Underground Railroad and not knowing exactly where you were and that feeling of unease. Um, but the way that they use these materials, the, the metal roof transitioning down into a vertical metal siding was something that we thought was, was very powerful. Um, this, as, as we move into thinking more about our materials and how we develop the exterior design, we liked the idea of simplifying the material palette. And I'll show you back what we had at Concept, but we had sort of five materials back at Concept and, and we wanted to simplify that. And we thought this was a really effective way to do that. So this standing seam metal, you can see this is an example in different cases where that flows from the roof down to the wall. You can see on the, the image on the left, 
um, a look of some of those metal panel types with a, with a red brick uh, in this case. That's one material. The second material we've talked about for a long time, this is the translucent fiberglass panel. Uh, these images I think are great to kind of give you a sense of what the space is. So the image on the right hand side of the slide in the interior view, whether that's a conference room or whatever it is, you can see that diffuse daylight. You don't have direct views out, but you have that nice diffuse natural light. And then the other three images show the, uh, the view from the outside. So whether you're at dawn or dusk and you have kind of a gentle glow coming out or in the lower right hand slide in direct sun that material reads as much more opaque right and a, a different material on the facade so at concept this is this is kind of where we were and i mentioned we had five materials right so we had a we had a metal roof we had the translucent panel we had a low brick water table maybe more of a buff we had some type of horizontal uh, siding coming on there. So we had, we had a bunch of different things going on. Um, and at early on in the design stage, we, we had focused obviously on how the forms and the volumes evolved in the program, but we wanted to tighten up that exterior material and respond to that comment from the planning commission. So here's, here's where we are today. And the, the building now is really three primary materials. So the forms haven't really changed. Um, but to us, this feels a lot more Centerville. Now we have, um, you can see now that the sort of primacy of the red brick has taken, you know, a much higher importance on the facade. All those areas that were horizontal siding have now become the red brick. The water table grows up into those areas. The leftover areas on the facade, we've now taken that metal roof and wrapped it down um, just in a vertical thing, a little nod to the barns with a, with a vertical siding. Uh, and the translucent panel is the part that really hasn't changed uh, from, from what you've seen in the past. Um, so that's, that's where the design is now. When, when we showed this to the planning commission, uh, it was pretty favorable received. It was nothing that they were voting on um, at that point, but we did, we did receive a lot of positive feedback. Um, and again, we're hoping that that leads to a, to an approval, uh, in, in May, but that's the, uh, that's the update of where we've been since you, you last saw us and, and where the project is going and happy to take any, any questions. Looks great. Mr. Smith, you got any questions? In, <laughs> in the numbers we have for a budget, you still feel we're in that? So we, at the end of the schematic design, we actually did our first uh, third party estimate that happened at the end of schematic design. So the building right now is just under 18 million. We, um, in the concept stage, when we were putting a square foot number on it, uh, just based on what we'd seen for commercial construction around, um, we were asking you to carry a $500 square foot number, which was putting us right at 17 million. So you're a touch over that. We're just under 18 million on the first. Touch over a million. Yeah. Well, that's easy. I mean, a millions a million dollars. Yeah, under. So eight, 18, 18 million is the first, um, that's the first formal estimate that, that we've had. So at this stage in schematic, we still carry a seven and a half percent design contingency, which is about 1.25 million. Um, as, as you move further into the design, we'll do an estimate at the end of design development and we'll do an estimate at the end of construction documents, which is right before you go out to bid. At each stage of that further refinement, that estimate uh, will get more and more honed in. It's always, uh, you don't know what the building really costs until bid day, until you see who bids it and you see and who the bidders are and how hungry they are and what the competition is. I mean, I mean, that's what it is. But, um, but right now that's the first estimate is right at 18 million. So we're, we're, we're a little over right now, a million. I mean, we started off at 17, now you're at 18. Yeah. And as an architect, I know you want to do a great job and have this thing look nice and all that. Sure. We've got to be responsible and also talk to our county commissioners and say, you know, talking seven you know we're talking 17 now we're talking 18 sure i hope you don't come back and tell me 20 someday yeah me too absolutely yeah um and i'm hopeful we'll have options like we typically do on any project we'll stop out. we are right so they'll yeah. 
they'll bid it out with some add um, options to either drop some yeah, things add, or add some things. Either so add or deduct alternates. Deduct, the, so. Those are vehicles we can use. Um, you know, clearly uh, the the way to really reduce the budget is to reduce scope or which means size of the building, right? Um, and so that's a, a conversation that obviously the, the, the board and the commissioners um, need to have. The, the program in terms of the square footage, you heard that we're going from 47,000 down to 34,000. So the, um, the departments feel pretty strongly about the square footages that are in there right now. So cutting, cutting square footages would be a difficult thing to do. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a one-time cost. It but is. The yeah. other thing is, I guess what is in the back of my head, and probably a lot of these board members, our Canala High School has doubled its roof, the cost of replacement. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, when I see that, and then I think all this other construction, yeah. it just, you know, it's... it's, it's yeah, it, it, there's no doubt about it. Since, really, since the pandemic hit, the, the um, trying to hit construction budgets or where things is going to come in is a totally different ballgame than it's ever been before. That's 100% true. Um, we absolutely, again, this is the first time it's we, you've had a formal estimate. It, it's certainly our intent, right, that that cost is going to stay in that zone. And, and we feel we feel good about the relationships we have with the cost estimator and, and um, sort of the validity of their numbers, as difficult as that is in today's market, yeah. I think what's challenging about this is that because it's a central office and it's not a school that we don't get any um, participation at the state level at all. So not sure. 90, uh, 90, I mean, 100% of this cost comes to funded. us. Um, Air uh, right. tax and rate where, of Queen's uh, County. Right, so yeah. if it's, you know, with our schools, you know, a certain percentage of that comes from the state and, you know, the IAC has now changed it where some of those soft costs, such as what we're engaged in right now, yeah. is included in that calculation. Um, so that's probably the, the, the biggest challenge right now is that 100% of that cost comes right to the county commissioners. Yep. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. All right, thanks. <clears throat> Got it. All right, policy regulations 620, 620.1, Dr. Yes, Salins. Yes, please. I wanted to um, come and, and I promised to, um, uh, to clarify mm -hmm. and talk about the materials and instruction policy 620 and regulation 620.1. Um, Dr. Kibler is going to help me out by putting up a presentation and following through. But really the purpose of this is just to review um, that information. And I wanted to start with a little bit of history of how, how do we get to where we are right now. So in August of 2018, um, this policy for materials of instruction and the regulation were actually adopted by the board. Um, in, in May of 2021, um, the, the board made a decision to deny the adoption of a book called Harbor Me. Um, so that was part of a collection that came forward. There was a 3-2 vote on that to, to not include that as part of an adoption. So in May of 2021, um, we had several teachers that said, well, hey, if we get donated copies of Harbor Me, can we accept those into our classroom libraries? And um, according to the policy, um, they, we can't do that because it's not um, something that's been adopted by the board. So that's when all this kind of came to light and, and why it came to light, that that policy and regulation was there. However, we needed to really reiterate that um, back to the teachers to make sure that they didn't have books in their collection um, that were not approved by the board. Uh, so, and, and even if it was a gift or a donation, if you see their regulation procedure four, is that gifts and donations of instructional materials um, are you know exempt and and you must comply with them being approved. So that led us to August when we did um, a verbal and a written reminder to our staff 
um, that this is it because we did find one in uh, in a classroom library that wasn't approved. So kind of led us to, oh, we, we better put ourselves on alert because we, we need to make sure teachers know that if it's a book that was denied by the board, it can't be in the classroom library. So that's where this kind of all came to be. So where do we go from here? Well, certainly something's not working right because we don't want to discourage kids from reading. That's ridiculous. Sure. We definitely want to provide them opportunities to have choice within what they read. Um, so I'm letting the board know and informing the board that under Dr. Sprankle's leadership and her CNI team, because this really isn't just a language arts thing, this is a policy that impacts all of our content, and especially at the secondary level. So I um, it, have charged Dr. Sprankle to revisit the current policy by creating a committee. Um, those parents who have had concerns, if you'd like to participate and have a voice at the table, we welcome you to do that. Um, you simply can reach out to Dr. Sprankle um, or her, her assistant who is also with us, Mrs. Andrews is here this evening, um, reach out to either one of them if you'd like to participate. Um, the charge will be to generate recommendations off of whatever findings. They're gonna have to investigate, they're gonna have to do some research. Often we look at other districts. What are other districts doing to address the same type of concerns? Because usually um, if there's a concern out there, it's not something that's just a concern to one district. Usually it's been you know, impacted in other districts. So they will be asked to generate recommendations and that would be to either consider um, options for clarification within the policy and regulation that we have currently or to identify a separate set of guidelines that would just um, be out, that would be clear guidelines for classroom libraries. So that will be their charge. And, um, and what we will do is Dr. Sprankle will actually come back to the board after she has an opportunity to meet with the committee, do the committee work, and she'll come back um, with actually a result. Those recommendations won't come to the board. Those recommendations will come to the superintendent any changes to the policy or regulation. The policy would come for um, an approval of the board, just like it would any other time. The regulation um, is in my authority to change, but I would make it an informational item, as I always do, to inform the board that there's changes there. And obviously, if we add any type of guidelines, um, that would be an informational item for the board, but that will be their charge. And um, we hope that we could have this done um, in a timely fashion to kick off the new year next school year, because it's gonna take a little time. We wanna make sure we give it the time it needs and deserves um, but whatever recommendations, put them in place and have them ready to go for the start of the school year. So that's my update. Questions? Yes. Sure. So this policy is talking mostly about instructional material. Correct. From what I understand, mm -hmm. what we're talking about or the comments that keep coming up for addressing are non-instructional material. This is stuff that you have in your library that is age appropriate for that classroom that students are allowed to take and read if they are done with whatever it is they're done doing. Right. So, and this has been what the clarification's been, is that we don't have downtime during, it is expected, it is expected that, that teachers um, at a high school English class or a high school biology class teach from bell to bell, that they don't have time where it's like choice read where they sit down for 15 or 20 minutes and get to pick a book. And the books that are there are actually supplemental materials to your materials of instruction. So they really are, they're in the classroom to supplement what the teachers are doing. And that's why they have to be approved by the board. But not every child, is, I mean, yes, teachers are supposed to teach from but not every child is going to be engaged that entire time. And they should be. We're, the expectation is that they, that they are. You give a, I, I'm not trying to argue or be argumentative, no. but you give a, an exam, right? And that exam, you've given 30 minutes to that class to take that exam. I got a student that finishes in 20. So for 10 minutes, they're just supposed to sit there? No, the teacher actually, depending on the various levels, has like a, what I can be doing, what I have to do, and then what I can do. So when I finish what I have to do, then I have options of what I can do. And for a lot of students, that's just personal reading time. Does this also, um, are we also going to address books that a child brings with them to school? Are they... That's not able. part of this. The, yeah, no well, I did hear that was like, I don't know if you're still here. Or is it you? One, uh, two or three comments was talked about independent reading, like the books they bring into school. I did hear that was a couple right. of the comments. Well, I, I, I don't think that, 
So the clear answer is that it so doesn't pertain to that. So that doesn't apply to that. Right, the, absolutely not. If a child's all. reading on the <clears throat> bus, I mean, some of our kids, I can't read on the bus because of the motion sickness, but kids read on the bus, they yes. read at lunchtime, they read as they're sitting before school, after school, waiting on a parent, whatever. That's their personal choice. Right. It doesn't have to be, that's not during the instructional time of the day. But can they have that book if it's not an approved book by the board, if that's, that's a personal book for them a personal to bring book in? They can have it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Because I think that's part of the confusion because not just a teacher's personal library, but I sent my child, I let my child read a book. Sure, and when they they're done read. doing whatever they're if, doing and if, they have time, they're trying to read it, but it's not on that approved right. list. So now if they're as being long told as it's they not can't. during the instructional time that's designated for students. If it's during the instructional time, then it's under the purview of our policy. Mm -hmm. and that's it. So give us a chance to create a committee gotcha. and, and give us a chance to do that. I mean, you know, we can sit here and go back and forth all night, but according and to our policy now, we're doing what our policy says. And um, so let's take a time to really look at the policy and let's hear from the committee, let them research it and give recommendations of whether we need to change the policy, do we need to change the regulation, do we need to do a separate guidelines just for classroom libraries. There's some options that we have here, but, but let a committee do the work instead uh -huh. of just one person, you know, making a flat decision without having the, the, the research right. behind them to make a really good informed decision. Mm -hmm. But, so that's but, how but right now, here, as it stands right now, if you got that a child that brings here. a book from home, as long as it's, it's not a, and during the instructional time. So as, the, as the I said, time, lunch time, the bus, lunchtime, bus, absolutely. Right. They can read that Abs book. Absolutely. Right. I did it. Yeah. Everybody should do it. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I think we need to give our teachers a little credit, too. I because, think we should. You know, it, if I see Mark reading Harbor Me in class, and I know that that's, I'm not gonna call him out and embarrass yeah, sure. him. I might, you know, right. take time to talk to him a little bit on the side, or maybe just call the parent or whatever and say, hey, this is a book that during our instructional time, sure. we can't read. So, I mean, I, you know, we have really good relationships with our mm -hmm. kids, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and our teachers are amazing with that, yep. and I, I think agree. that, you know, um, we, I, I think they do that. I, I really do think they do that. And so. I support them 100%. I think that's the point. We just need to continue to do that. Right, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Right. And that was part of the secondary novels program, I believe, that book. Yes. That was, that was brought to you for choice, for right. choice reading. Exactly, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which had to be approved by the board or, or exactly. not approved. Yeah. Yep, that's correct. And just, and just a quick, like Mark said, a quick summary. You know, when the bell rings for school, school started. Prior to school, after school, whatever Absolutely. they can read what they i mean it's what the parents and they decide the way they want them to read right. we Lunch, mentioned they, graphic novels so if they have sure. a half an hour at lunch and they want to read rather than eat read rather than eat yep and along with what shannon's saying if you're in an instructional classroom that's supposed to be for teaching at that time absolutely i think there might be some like you said there's always an instance where something could change a little bit if they were right. testing or doing something but that's something probably needs to be more refined because this isn't black and white and we probably need to have a little bit more Right. common sense flexibility absolutely and i think that can happen because from the people i've talked to it acts like it's cut and dry but it's really not it's, it's just really, right you know, exactly i think i think we can yeah. get through this and i, I think, think having that too. committee would absolutely help. absolutely mm -hmm. you're good okay up for it <laughs> very good thank you board all right any further questions or comments from the board student members you got any comments <laughs> how does the Will the committee like talk about what would happen if a teacher has a non-instructional approved book that's on her shelf that she's allowed to then rent out to students so they can take it to their own home outside of instructional hours? And it, it may. I, I don't know that I can answer that question. I kind of would need for the committee to go ahead and you know produce that um, document. As I said whether that's a change to the actual policy or regulation or whether it's a completely separate guideline that has maybe something like that in there, you know, that they can have books that might have, need a parent, um, you know, um, sign off on or something. I, I don't know what the committee will come up with, but I know that there's, as I said, school districts out there that have policies um, and guidelines on classroom libraries. So there's, I think, some rich materials out there that we can go to and look at. And I know Dr. Sprankel will do a nice job leading, so leading the charge. Ultimately, it just needs to be clear. So everybody, there's no yes. doubt in That's anybody's exactly mind right. what is approved and what's not, or what's appropriate and what's not. Yep. In, in the classroom. Yes. yes, in the classroom. Yep. All right. Thank you. And everybody, we still have opt out. 
I mean, if there's a book that some parent does not want their students being taught, so they can opt out for books too, That's right? part of the curriculum, so correct. So right. if, if there's a part of the curriculum, um, say in the health curriculum, because that's usually a, a, a topic, topic, right? If there's a particular um, material of instruction um, that, that they're, they're gonna use and the parent, uh, will we find an alternate assignment for the student. Mm -hmm. And same thing with language arts, right? If there's a book that a parent, or a book that's been yeah, assigned to students. Sometimes it's religion, sometimes sure, it's you know, it so different, right. you know, different reasons why people choose to. They've got the opportunity to, to opt out and the school mm -hmm. will provide another novel that's yes. more Correct. appropriate. Correct. Okay. All right, moving on. First read of policy 503, student attendance, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Dr. Kibler. Thank you. Good evening, President Schiffinelli, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. For the record, my name is Matt Evans, supervisor of student services. Before you tonight is policy 503, student attendance. This, the last time this policy was updated was 2018. Uh, this new update just reflects the new vision statement that was created as well as uh, a change in the definition of chronically absent from 20% to 10% to align with the state. All right, and this is first read, and this is up on the website, right? Correct. So the public can go and, and review it, and if they've got comments or concerns, they can voice those, correct? Correct. All right, and we get three reads before it comes up for a vote. Yes, sir. Right. Correct. And, and then strike and delete so you can see where the changes have been. That's on our for board. I'm saying it's the same thing the public can say. Yes. And also with it is the regulation, um, just for your information, the, the main update there was we um, are taking out the high school denial of credit. That's on page six. Um, ultimately, um, we felt it didn't apply at this time. All right, um, board, you got any questions on that? Welcome back, Helen. Let's see. Oh, he and actually, then 501, yeah, she, yeah he actually he just went over, oh, right, the, it went over the regulation oh, as well, correct? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So first read policy 510, Mr. Evans. Uh, policy 510, destruction of information. This was one of those one line policies from 1993 that, that we needed to update. And so it was really a complete rewrite, basically completely based off of the Maryland Student Records Manual, FERPA and Comar. Right, Again, everybody. first read. Yep, first read, same drill, it's up on the website. Any comments or questions from the board? All right, let's move on. Policy Thank six, you. Up. Policy <laughs> six or seven. Thank you, Doc, uh, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Dr. Sprankle. Right. Evening again, President Schiffinelli, Jusalins, board members, executive team, for the record, I am Marcia Sprinkle. I am the Assistant Superintendent. I bring before you tonight Policy 607. It's Comprehensive Curriculum Management Policy. Um, this policy has had edits because of the fact back in December of 2018, the multicultural education that is multicultural was repealed. Comar was repealed specifically. And so it was replaced with educational equity. Mm -hmm. And so multicultural has been pulled from educational, actually educational, education that is multicultural was actually repealed. I wanna repeat myself again. Repealed and replaced with educational equity. Okay, to make sure that our policy is in line with Comar that's been shifted at the State Department. So that's why those edits are there. So this is the first read. It's posted on the website. It's redlined. And also we welcome any kind of comments. So there's really not much change, right? Just some administrative? No. 
uh, adjustments? Just to align with the new Comar. Yeah. Right. Which was in 2018. It's not real, real new, but no. it's been a while since we made revisions to our policy. Right. Well, but as you know, um, under the direction of Dr. Kibler, we um, put all of our policies on a timeline for review because they had many of them hadn't been reviewed in many, many years and um, should be reviewed no less than every four years. So um, that's why this is coming across now that um, we have an opportunity to review policies and, and see that this is not a lot. Right, yeah. and, and I know Dr. Kibler's done a great yeah. job managing that. <laughs> it's, yes. a so. it's a lot. It's a lot. It is. All right. And Comar was changed. Uh, equity in education. I yes. think a lot of us are familiar with that. And um, and so that's everything looks fine. And that's first read? Yes. Okay. All right. Is. And same thing. I mean, the public can go take a look, review it, and Absolutely. make comments. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Spankel. All right. Moving on. First read for policy 638 student behavior interventions. Ms. Smith. Good evening, President Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. For the record, my name is Jolene Smith. I'm the supervisor of special education. Um, I bring before you this evening a first read on policy 638, student behavior intervention. Uh, this is to bring our policy in line with Comar regulations that were updated or changed uh, effective July 1 of 2022. Um, kind of a brief overview of the changes again very similar clerical changes nothing in terms of procedure or practices actually changing um, we did remove the term seclusion from the policy itself um, we have not actually practiced seclusion uh, prior to this um, change in Comar. However, we are removing the, the language from the policy itself because seclusion is no longer permitted in the public school system. Um, we also defined a functional behavior assessment as well as trauma-informed intervention and then altered the definition of restraint to bring it in alignment with the language that's reflected in Comar. Any uh, questions, concerns? No? Thanks. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. We're at 5.09, second read, policy 415, employment of substitute teachers. Dr. Null. Good evening, Mr. President, Dr. Salins, members of the board and executive team. For the record, Michael Knoll, Director of Human Resources. I come before you tonight with this second reading of the uh, update of Policy 415, our employment of substitute teachers. This is one of those policies that was a decade old and needed some revamping to modernize it with our current technology and onboarding all virtual. Those changes were made posted for a month we have no public comments at this time so would like to come before you next month with a final read and board action proposal all right we'll see you then thank you let's see blueprint implementation plan dr kibler Good evening, Mr. Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, board members and executive team, uh, Dr. Kibler, Director of Accountability and Implementation. Um, I come tonight to um, present to you, it's posted on board docs, the first submission, first official submission of the Queen Anne's County Public Schools Blueprint Implementation Plan. Um, you might recall that on March 1st, I shared where we were in our rough draft status of the implementation plan. We submitted that. Um, with the state's deadline to the uh, Accountability and Implementation Board and Maryland State Department of Education on March 15th. Um, it's actually going through um, two approval processes. I believe right now we are through phase one, the first piece of approval process where it was actually reviewed three separate times, making sure we answered it completely. Um, 
uh, all the links and things, all the attached artifacts were present and, and worked. And then the third thing was all of our data tables, um, you know, data, followed data suppression rules and things like that. So there was no identifiable information. So I, I do believe we're, we're past that first um, submission, which is a big milestone because it just means that we, we would not have any potential funding withheld or anything like that, which we've talked about as a potential implement, uh, implement uh, potential problem with the implementation plans if, if we had any issues. So I think we're, we're good there. And now we're waiting for sort of content. Um, we should know something by the end of April, early May, and we'll have uh, till June to go back and forth with the Accountability and Implementation Board and MSDE. Uh, this was a huge undertaking. As you know, we've been talking about this for 18 months. We've been working on the plan since the beginning of December. There's a long list of people I want to thank, and I was going to do that tonight, and then I thought, just in case it gets kicked back, we still need the help from those people. I'm going to wait I'm going to wait till we have that final, uh, fi final uh, green light, but uh, I do appreciate everybody's help and, and your input and, and your guidance through this. All right. We appreciate what you're doing, too. Yep. I know it's been a big job for a long time. Yep. It's still lots to go. So. Yeah, 10 more years. <laughs> I'm gonna right. look, and when we look at this document, the first page, the last page is 153, so it's not a short document. No, it's not. So if you have trouble going so, to sleep at night. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, just pull it out. Yeah. Okay, it'll put but you but I mean, it, it, it took a lot to do this. I mean, it is, and there's a lot of good information in there. Um, it, again, this first phase was just our approach to implementing the blueprint in Queen Anne's County. So it'll be a lot more in, in the subsequent years about what we're actually doing, how things will change. And uh, we're, we're really excited about it. All right. Thanks, Dr. Kibler. And sure. you're still on board with Dr. Salen's school year end date, 2023. Yeah, I asked Dr. Kibler to, um, we've had a lot of questions, so I want to make sure that, you know, for those people that listen in, that we can clarify any questions they may have about the last day of school. Sure. So there was a press release that went out, I believe it was yesterday, it might have been uh, yeah, that was, it was yesterday. Uh, the last official day of school for students is going to be um, June 8th. There will be a teacher professional day on June 9th. There was some question about embedded, um, embedded snow days, and we obviously did not close for inclement weather this year. The snow days were not embedded as necessarily student days. We had contingency days built in this year in case we needed them uh, with weather closing. So that was Martin Luther King Day, President's Day, and the last day, June 9th, if we would have needed it during the teacher um, professional day. So we didn't need it. We don't need any of those contingency days. And again, the way the calendar was set up for this current school year, we don't have, we don't have to pull back any of those days for not using. So this, this previous calendar wasn't like our normal calendar years where you had three to five days worked in. They were contingency days that actually, if we needed them before that date, you went to school, we didn't need them, we didn't go to school, and that's how it worked. Exactly. That's correct. And next year's calendar, we have built in both contingency days and um, embedded days. So I think there's six days. Uh, five days. Five days next year. Based on feedback from our school system improvement committee, uh, citizens advisory council, we do have five days. So there are three embedded days. So if you would count student days for the 23-24 school year, Right now, it looks like there's 183 that we will pull back to 180 if necessary, if, if we have another winter like this one. But we also have the two weather contingency days. Um, they are still Martin Luther King Jr. Day and uh, President's Day. So there are, there are the five. Mr. Pender, you did a good job not calling snow days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, we did it two years in a row. Remember that? Not lucky. <laughs> don't, don't tell the kids that. Yeah, right. <laughs> kids are Thank you, Any questions? Yeah, Thank sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, 5.12, expenditure status reports. Ms. Towers. Good evening once again. Uh, tonight we bring before you your detailed expenditures for period, end, period ending March 31st, 2023 both in detail and in summary for your review. And it, lo it looks like we're in categories pretty good. That includes our uh, later on 
Correct. assessment that's included in this one right here. Um, and, and then we have some negative amounts that we'll address with the budget amendment coming up later on. Correct. Questions? Concerns? Anybody? All right, Esther 2 and Esther 3 break down. All right, Esther 2 is getting ready to wrap up. The end date's 9 23 The available balance is a little under 100000 It will be spent out um, before summer. And then Esther 3 goes another year. And this is going to, um, this supported our summer school program last year, or summer enrichment program. And this year it'll go to help supporting the credit recovery at the high school. Quick right. question, um, Ms. Towers, about the ESSER two. Are we, use, are, is, is any of that going towards summer school this year? Or what are we use bringing it down? Where we... um, in, in ESSER two, what's remaining is your indirect costs, which is our um, administrative piece. Okay of under 20,000. There's gonna be some supplies and materials as well as uh, Schoology for um, finishing up the year. Thanks. Of course. Any more questions? No? All right, right now we're scheduled for a break. Um, can I get a consensus? Do we wanna take a break or keep going? Oh, I say keep running. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. All right, <laughs> keep going. All right, human resources and substitute bus driver report. I think everybody's had a chance to consider that. Mm -hmm. Can I get a vote? I or, uh, move that we accept the HR report as presented. Second. All right, uh, I have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ms. Cox, Frog Street, Frog Street PK curriculum adoption. Good evening, President Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, members of the board and the executive team. For the record, I'm Cheryl Cox, the supervisor of early learning, English language arts, pre-K through two, ESOL and migrant education. On March 1st, we brought to you an information item with the results of our pre-K um, pilot for Frog Street. It was our selection. I talked to you about Franny the Frog. Mm -hmm. We had a 30-day review. All the feedback was extremely positive. At this time, we're looking to move forward with the adoption of Frog Street for all our pre-K classrooms as our integrated curriculum in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. I did have a couple questions about financial. Um, what was the delta? You said two of the programs that you looked at, two of the three met your needs, um, except for the um, conscious discipline in the third one. What were the delta in the two programs? What were the, I'm wise? sorry. What was the um, difference in cost between the two programs that did meet our needs? Uh, it was a couple thousand dollars. I don't know that I have that quote with me. It was a couple thousand dollars difference. This one was slightly more. Okay, and then um, it says there's a 3% fee for credit card over 50,000. How are we paying this? I guess maybe this, I don't know if Ms. Towers wants to answer. Right, we'll pay by, um, we'll secure by a purchase order and then follow up with a check once everything is received. Okay, thanks. And then I was wondering what the kits look like because it's one third of the money is spent just in shipping and handling. Like. Well, when we ordered that big old school, big. right, but the yeah. scoreboard's only thirteen fifty, and that's like common carrier. Right. Um, so I'm wondering why we're So paying. the kit itself, the teacher's kit is a very large kit, and you open it up, and it's got all sorts of books. You've got big books for the kids. Mm -hmm. Those are going to require lots of extra boxes. You've got all of the developmental um, centers and things go with it, so all of them are in crates that come along. It's quite a vast amount of materials per classroom, and that will get them through all their subject areas of each and every day of the school year. Okay, because that's a 30% ship of the cost is in shipping. Mm -hmm. That's pretty huge. Okay, all right, thanks. Sure. We'll, we'll invite the board members out once we get a class yes, set up. Yeah. Yeah. No, just, <laughs> no, just, no, just see the volume. Awesome. Just, and well, you have to meet yeah. Franny the Frog. Did you? Did you? Of course. He's <laughs> amazing. Of so. course, is he being shipped as <laughs> Franny comes in the box. <laughs> All right, if there's no other questions, do I hear a motion? I move to accept the Frog Street as our PK curriculum adoption. Um, fiscal impact is gonna be $56,459.88 and the budget will be local funds. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 
All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Our four-year-olds thank you as well. Oh, yeah, cool. I'm really excited. <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, Ms. Passon, come on up. Um, R-E-L-A, English Language Arts, K-5, text adoption. Yes. Good evening, President Schifanelli, members of the board, Dr. Salins, and members of the executive team. For the record, my name is Bridget Passon. I'm the English Language Arts Supervisor for grades 3 through 12. Um, I sit before you tonight to ask for approval of adoption for into reading for our K-5 classrooms in the RELA block. I presented to you in March all of our findings, different things kids had said, how, what our teachers voted on. Um, we did put it out for public comment. We put actual examples in all of our elementary school offices and um, great suggestion Mr. Smith we were able to get logins where teachers parents um, and any other stakeholder could see what it looks like from both the teacher side and the student side um, so that went out for 30 days um, lots of teachers already digging around in it already which I of course lo loved knowing and hearing but we have had no objections um, so I'm here tonight with it as an action item to ask for approval to adopt all right, questions, concerns? Board members, do I hear a motion? Yes, uh, Mr. President, I move to approve the in-reading for our um, Relay K-5 through text adoption in the amount of $664,262.55 from budget source fiscal year 23, local for grades four and five, 300, breaking it down $341,595.55 for the Maryland Leeds, and then for grades K through three, $322,667. All right, we have a motion, I'm sorry. We have, <laughs> we have a motion and a second, thank you. All right, hooray, right. thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited, I'm too excited. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. Two high fives, because I'm excited yeah. for both of those. Yes, thank you. Nice job. Mr. Page, good evening. Outdoor classroom tables. 7.05. Good evening, everyone. Uh, oh, he's doing oh, hang on. He's I'm sorry. Let me first. just reintroduce first, you. Yeah. yeah, we're at 7.04, new course approval, outdoor adventure. Mr. Page. <laughs> President Schifanelli, members of the board, uh, Dr. Salins, executive team. For the record, my name is Michael Page. I am the curriculum supervisor that oversees science, PE, health, and um, environmental literacy. Uh, I bring forward a uh, new course approval to you all. Um, to implement the Outdoor Adventure is a one credit elective physical education course for students in grades 11 and 12. This will be a new course for the program of study beginning in 2023-2024 school year. Uh, in 2000, just a little bit of background, in 2022, Maryland Department of Education published the new Maryland Physical Education Framework, which aligns to the national and state physical education standards. The national and state standards for physical education play a critical role in education. The whole child is part of a well-rounded education. Physical, physical education is unique to the school's curriculum as it is the only program that provides students with opportunities to learn motor skills, development fit, fitness, gain under gain an understanding of the importance of physical activity. And this course would mainly focus on the level two high school physical education standards. Um, so I recommend, the, the superintendent recommends the uh, board approval of the new course, Outdoor Adventure, beginning in 2023-2024 school year. All right, and I'm looking at the description here. Mm -hmm. cool. Fishing, yes. fly fishing, fly tying. It's really cool. Survival skills. I'm down with that. Yes. <laughs> Backpacking, <laughs> you navigation, can. drown proofing, outdoor cooking. This is all great oh, stuff. Oh, you cannot attend. <laughs> oh, not man. You are welcome to attend. Yes, yes, speaker. <laughs> right, there you go. I did have a question. Who's, yes. I mean, I assumed that it was going to be PE teachers, but these are some really cool expertise things that we have. We're a Waterman community. Do mm -hmm. we have any um, partnerships? Guests? Lecture yes. Or, okay. So, so we are working with that. Uh, we've we've um, already begun conversations with the new Y uh, um, in terms of utilizing their facilities for uh, our aquatic portions of these plant. Uh, this this course, we're looking at a lot of our um, DNR Department of Natural Resources in terms of coming in and training on maybe some of the boating activities and, and boating uh, certifications that could possibly go through here. Uh, we're also looking at. Um, 
some of our environmental educational partners um, that are already providing services for us to help out with a lot of those activities and services too. So absolutely, um, this, is, this is something that I think not only the students, the teachers, but also the surrounding uh, partners are really excited about. No, it's very, it's very exciting. I felt like President Schifanelli that this, the description is awesome. <laughs> yeah. I do also would like to attend, yes. But, uh, Chaperones. All right. Yes. Thanks. I do have a slightly related, non-related question. So sixth grade, we're not doing those trips anymore. Are we going to replace those or find another? Because this is sort of finding another avenue, but this is for 11th and 12th graders, not. What are we doing about the sixth grade crew? Are you, are you referencing North Bay? Yes. Um, currently, we're not attending North Bay. Correct. Are for the For the week long. Are we going to try to find something to replace that? I know this is sort of slightly off topic, but it's in the same category of activities. No, we, we do have several other things kind of baked in that are more local um, to our curriculums. Even just today, we were at Ag Day for seventh grade um, right here in our, you know, in our backyard and for at the 4-H park. So we have really made a conscious effort to try to utilize what's really right here in our district okay. in the best interest of our students. So I would, I would agree that we've infused it throughout the multiple grade levels okay. rather than the focus being on a specific grade level. Um, and, and so we, we provide those opportunities at K to 12. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Your motion. Mr. President, I recommend uh, to, I move to approve the outdoor adventure curriculum for 11th and 12th graders. Uh, for budget sources, fiscal year 23 year and unrestricted funds, the dollar amount will be as needed. Second. All right, I have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Wonderful, thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. That's exciting. And, uh, now we're at 7.05, outdoor okay. classroom tables. All right. Um, so th this particular item I bring before you is the approval to purchase the outdoor uh, educational tables for the numerous schools within the district. So uh, we would be utilizing a Mid-Atlantic uh, purchasing team cooperative purchasing contract for schools furniture. Just so you know, this is a similar contract that we utilized for um, tables for our cafeteria, outside cafeterias um, and the schools were able to purchase. We'll provide five new outdoor educational tables for the following schools, Bayside Elementary School, Centerville Elementary School, Churchill Elementary School, Graysonville Elementary School, Kennard Elementary School, Ken Island Elementary School, Mattapeak Elementary School, and Southersville Elementary School. The tables will be placed in the outdoor educational classrooms, which you all have uh, been briefed on uh, prior. Um, and uh, the action is the superintendent recommends the board's approval of the contract to Duran for new outdoor educational tables in the amount of $47,410. Okay, and I see these are mounted to the concrete, right? And they're going to do the assembly and, and all that. Is that correct? To the bottom line, it's all our elementary schools who have this. Excuse me. These are all our elementary schools. Yes, sir. Everyone. Correct. Line. All schools that are receiving an outdoor educational pavilion. So, and this was all, well. They're the metal tables going into the concrete, and this is from the, it was a grant, right? The gears is initially grant. Correct. Grant, this okay. is the. F sure. The funding okay. source is through the GEARS Here. 2 grants, which is the Governor's Emergency Educational Relief. Great. Thank you. Okay. Mr. President, I move to accept the um, contract for the outdoor adventure tables at the eight elementary schools in the amount of $47,410. Oh, sorry, $47,410. It is budgeted with the governor's emergency educational relief, um, the year two funds. Um, oh, I guess that would be all you need. I would second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. All right. All right. You're still with us. Still with you. <laughs> okay, elementary K through five, science dimension digital platform, HMH. Yes, so I bring for you the approval of a contract between Queens County Public Schools and H HMH Publishing Company to purchase a one-year license for the HMH Science Dimensions grades five, K to five. Um, this was an agreement that we purchased in 2017. Uh, 
and the curriculum resource to implement 2018-2019 school year. The HMH Science Dimension Program is currently our primary instructional resource for science in grades K to 5 in 2022-2023. The school year is the final year of the contract and requires renewal of the digital component of the curriculum. Uh, this, this particular item is unrestricted operating budget in the cost of 80000 uh, eight hundred and fifty six dollars and the action is the superintendent recommends the board's approval of the contract between Queen Anne's County Public Schools HMH publishing company to purchase a one-year license for the HMH science dimensions grades K to 5 in the amount of eighty thousand eighty thousand eight hundred and fifty six dollars we're doing a one-year contract is, is there a reason for that not a multi-year don't have the money. <laughs> the the, um, I mean, yes. And, okay. Yeah, so that's the why. answer is mm -hmm. the cost. Yeah, yeah the cost. Yeah. Yeah. Would there be a big savings if we did it for two or three years? That is something that we would, we would have to look into. Um, it, it does come with a significant uh, allocation for that. Um, mm -hmm. But what I'm what I only thing I'm thinking is if something like this comes up and it, there's a big call, if we're going to do it every year. And we know we're going to do it for three years. It'd be something to have an option, so we can talk to probably our, our commissioners. It might be a better idea to fund it for and give I think them it's an a option. Great point. But I mean, if, if, if it's going to save yeah. thousands of dollars, and we're going to do it anyway, why do it every year if we can get a three-year commitment and, and and earmark that, mm -hmm. make it a special category? Say that this money is earmarked for a certain thing, but it's for a three-year commitment. And we used a lot of our ESSER funds to do multi-year mm -hmm. right, um, contracts, but that's over with now. And, exactly. So that's kind of where we are with it. But it, but in the Excellent future if we can do it and yes. you know and, and just tell them be upfront with them say this is going to be a earmark for this but it's a reoccurring cost that will come you know right. good point All right. so, so when did we need to know this i mean is this something we want to think know. about extending out or no i think i i would suggest we approve it now because we have to have it or need well, i didn't know if we if we had any leeway to have time ask or if you want to do that or do you just want us to move forward with this? I, I'd look to Jane more of the timeline of spending monies because I know yeah. April 15th is our cutoff date for purchases okay. before well. we go into the next, you know, to okay. give us time to kind of look at. And, and, and I think to get it into the budget cycle because FY24 is pretty well set for the budget okay. process. So it would be something to look at for the 25 okay. uh, budget cycle. All right. Mr. President, I move that we approve the contract between Queen Anne's County Public Schools and HMH Publishing to purchase the one-year license for the science dimensions of grade K through 5. Fiscal impact is $80,856. Budget source, unrestricted operating budget. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Very Page. much appreciate it. Thank you. I see you again. Yes. It was wonderful today. I can't wait for the board to hear all about it. Yes. But mm -hmm. Ag Day number one. Ag Day one was we got we got Tech. through. We got eight, Ag Day number two coming in. Yep, coming up tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> you couldn't have ordered better better weather. Yes. So thank you all. Good luck tomorrow. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. Oh, that's right. Last year it was cold. Yes, and rainy. And half of the kids were in shorts. Yes. And yeah. freezing to death. Yep. All right, Ms. Right. Towers, right. unrestricted budget amendment. Hopefully third time is a charm here. T tonight we bring before you a budget amendment for our unrestricted fund. The budget amendment is to allocate funds into our administration to account for additional legal fees and printing costs, uh, to add more funds into the maintenance, 320000 It's additional repairs that needed to be made as well as um, just... It, towards the end of the year and things are um, in need to be repaired. And then the final will be transportation, the additional fuel cost of 300,000. Plus in January, there was an approval from the board to purchase those two 2021 Thomas Motor Tour buses as well. So that's what we bring before you tonight. And well, those are the ones we, that were left over some other perks where we got them pretty reasonable, I and think. And they have been a big hit. They've, um, a big the hit. Bus drivers that drive them up to Baltimore City every day are just tickled to death. The smaller vehicle with the same safety features. Right and nice. It's really hit off very well. Great. All right. Comments? Questions? 
to hear a motion? Yes, Mr. President, I move to approve the request for Board of Education to move money from with the unrestricted budget amendment number five to move monies from special education to administration the amount of 100,000, instructional salaries and special education to maintenance in the amount of 320,000, and fixed charges to transportation in the amount of 300,000. Second. All right, motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Mr. Pender, you're going to see us all the way to citizen participation. Just in case you can talk. Uh -huh. And are we doing those all together? <coughs> That's upstairs. Uh, yeah, I, I think. Um, buses. Right, so 7.11 through 17, oh, yes, we can do okay. together. All right. And right now we're. We want to do them all together. Right now, no, we're no, at no, purchase no, no. affordable Sorry, classrooms. Yes. Yes. Island, yes. 7.08. Good evening again, uh, Sid Fender, um, COO. With me, I have uh, Jim O'Donnell, who is our maintenance <coughs> foreman. And for those of you that don't know, Jim is truly my right hand and left hand. Um, if I look at the blueprint and says it's buried over there, <laughs> he's going to tell me, no, it's buried over here. Um, so, brought Jim tonight just in case you have any questions on any projects. Um, he is truly the, the, you know, the eyes and ears out there and, and doing the work. So before us tonight, uh, before you tonight, sorry, we have a request to purchase um, um, three portables from Modular Genus, um, and uh, those are 24 by 36 square foot for 864 um, square foot altogether. And this will be utilized in a cooperative purchasing contract at Baltimore mm -hmm. County Public Schools um, used and we are also a member of the Baltimore Metropolitan Council which is the group that was offering this um, the total price will be three hundred and sixty two thousand four hundred and fifty eight dollars and that will be coming from FY 23 fund balance I do want to add that um, within that cost it does come for shipping and then the building setup anchoring seam skirting um, decks you know, and stairs, we will still be responsible for doing the sidewalks and the, the fire alarm and the PA systems. But this would be a one stop shop here of, you know, having those um, installed. If we were able to have this approved tonight, then this will allow us to meet our deadline of having them in place and set up by the time August rolls around um, for the ninth grade students to attend Ken Island High School. So the first question we're going to get is about security. Mm -hmm. Since these are portables outside of the building, they are not under the main roof. Um, what are we doing to? So we are looking at putting some additional fencing there. We've also adding additional a phone so and um, proximity card on the one side. So it's a shorter walk for students to get in and out. Um, and then also we have a couple other things that we want to do security wise that we're still kind of talking about um so there, there will be some things put in place for that okay. i do understand you i do understand your concerns mr sabori has been a part of okay. um, the Perfect. assessment of it you know yep. what i mean so some of the things that we will be putting in place we wouldn't necessarily share out to the public oh, to make perfect. sure that we would include right. you know security mm -hmm. pieces but he is absolutely a part of 100 percent of that okay. development of yeah. that plan I mean, you have the answer, but people would probably want to oh, hear. Oh, that's fine. Yes. Yep. Nope. Sure, and it's a great question. Oh, it is. It's a great question. Utilities. We have utilities close enough to hook everything up under a reasonable amount of cost? Somewhat. Um, we're going to have to get uh, probably an electrical engineer out there to, to look at what we have and where we're going to have to gain more power. Um, we had, at, at one time, we had eight portables out there. We're hoping, I'm hoping, that we can reutilize that and just do flow mold back out to the to three new portables. They got like split units or something in there to heat them with or cool them with. Or, yep, yep. So they should so be, I mean. They're all, they're, most of them are self-contained. Um, um, the newer portables are using a barb um, system that actually hangs on the side of the portable. So it's one unit, or actually two units that'll, that'll control everything. Like a mini split or something. Yep, or, yep. But it, I mean, it's still forced air. So. Right, oh yeah, right. Yeah. But, but we should have enough power oh, yeah, absolutely. somewhere out there to, absolutely. not to be have a yep. major. Thanks for asking Jim a question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you look uh, sit uh, 
<laughs> Remember, you introduced me to him one time. I told him to talk, ask him the questions. Okay. Mr. President, I move that we um, approve the contract between the Board of Education and the Modular Genius in the amount of $362,458 to provide and install three new portable classrooms at Ken Island High School to accommodate our ninth grade. Fund balance? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Fund balance is, thank you, tw uh, fiscal year 23. Fund balance. Second. All right, motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Sid, you're still on the secure festival? Can yes, I? Yes, sir. Um, this, the next two that we're going to uh, be presenting to you um, are secure vestibules. The first one is an approval of a contract between Vigil uh, Contracting Inc. and Queens County Public Schools to construct a secure vestibule, vestibule at the main entrance of Kennard Elementary School. Um, we'll be utilizing the Gordian Source Wall Cooperative Purchasing Contract. Um, we have the architectural plans and everything in place to modify those. Um, this will be for a cost of $154,354. And I'd like to say that this will be paid for by a grant that we applied for from the uh, Maryland Center for School Safety. So this will not be any money coming from the county as a grant that we are awarded. And this is, uh, Mr. O'Donnell can testify long overdue. When you walk into Kennard right now, there's nothing pushing you towards the office. So mm -hmm. this will involve a lot of um, brickwork, a lot of um, doorway and air conditioning and some different modifications to make that work. But you'll, you'll see a, a vast improvement with that. How long do we anticipate that taking to? It will be done this summer. Okay. So we're okay. trying to get these approved now so that <clears throat> when June 8th hits, boom. No pressure. No. I just think it, I think it shows the boards and staff's commitment to security because mm -hmm. there's three items we have that we're going to hopefully approve this evening for security of our, our, our buildings to upgrade. So I do have one question about the one for, since we're doing them two together, the one for Queen Anne's. Maybe I'll ask that offline. Never mind. <laughs> okay, you can ask me whenever. Or I think my biggest concern about that Queen Anne's County, when you come to the door, they have that window that is right into the office, yep. and then you have the door that lets you in. Mm -hmm. Nothing's protecting the ladies that sit by that window. Right. That's that's, that's what be this addressed. Will, that's that's going to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's all a great I know. question. No. But yeah, yeah, that is yeah. definitely addressed. Good. Mm -hmm. Right Thank now you. we're talking about. Are we just doing this one right now? We are mm -hmm. putting Kinar. both of these together, or one? Yeah, we can do both together. Let's go to the second one too while we're. Yeah, then I need to. All right, now So I'm sorry. It's the same. Yep. Well, it's the amount. So the, the second one, again, uh, is for Queens County Public Schools. And with the area that you were talking about, we will be reconfiguring that um, into a single point entry, forcing um, everybody into the main office, not just walking in and having a little you know, rope separates you from the rest of the school. Right. Um, again, we're utilizing the same source well contract. Um, it's $145,000. Um, oh, no, I'm okay. Oh. $29, and that will be coming out of the um, Maryland Center for School Safety Grant, oh, FY23. Okay, thank you. Fabulous. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's definitely needed because that's been a big issue mm -hmm. for a long time. Yes. We're not going to. That's a high travel. I mean, you're talking 1,200 students. Mm -hmm. And lots of different events all the time. So Every lots of community day. coming into the school mm -hmm. during the day. It, and yeah, it's used for, yeah, a yeah, lot more people come into that school than. Yeah, than in and we'll right. be Absolutely. coming back to you. We have some funding for one more school that we were able to squeeze out of the, the grants here. So nice. we're just waiting on final numbers for that one. All right. Have a motion? One of you and both. Uh, yeah, Mr. President, I move that we accept the. Oops, let me move down to action. I'm sorry. Approve the contract between the Board of Education and Vigil Contracting in the amount of $145,029 to construct a secure vestibule at Queen Anne's County High School. The budget source is SGP grant funding, fiscal year 23. And I ask for approval for the contract between Board of Education and the contracting in the amount of, let me find that one. Sorry, Carrie, I forget everything you just told me. $138,122.93 <laughs> $138, 
with a 5% contingency to construct a secure vestibule in the main entrance of Queens County High School. Canard. Canard. Elementary. I mean, Canard Elementary. I just did that. Oh, switch those. Right. Second. Okay. Motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, moving along. The next uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Five. Or? Three, five. New five. used bus. Okay, seven, eleven, twelve. All right, five. I'll take a word for you. Yeah. <laughs> New and used bus purchases. Mr. Pender. Sure. Do you want to group these all together in one? Mm -hmm. I yes. think so. All right, so I'll just say the bus number and um, all right. the, the owner. Um, first, we have bus 2510 um, from Mr. Uh, Whitlock that um, is eligible to be replaced. Um, the second bus is uh, bus 10409 for Mr. Hanzo. The third bus is uh, bus 1109 for Ms. Schaefer. The next bus is bus 10509 for Alfonso Sorrell. Next bus is bus 2910 for Sharon Asquith. And all of those buses are either in their will be in their 14th year or their 15th year. So um, if you remember, it was just 12 years that we had a few years ago until they added the extra three. So we've been able to get three more years out of those. And all um, of those buses, you know, will come with a PVA that we keep a schedule on um, just to make sure that we're staying consistent. So we're seeking approval tonight for, um, and some of them, have on there new or used mm -hmm. so if it is a used bus the pva will be rated at that year it would not be like a fy you know 23 it's just going to depend on the market and the manufacturing which is very slow right now can they get a waiver to run it like if they order a bus today after we give them approval and it doesn't come september the first can they run that bus for another couple no. of mm -hmm. once it hits that 15 year it's done you, you will see some at private schools that aren't held to those restrictions mm -hmm. that they can get a couple more years out of, but you're done. It's 15 done. Are we anticipating any of these being the smart buses or the no. electronic ones? <laughs> no. Not, no. Just thought I'd ask. Not, that, that's yeah. double the cost. Gotcha. Right. Any other okay, questions? any other questions or concerns? Discussion? I have a motion. Mr. President, I move that we approve the purchase of five new or used buses, 2510, for the buses 25109, 1040, 1109, 10509, and 2910, fiscal year operating budget, 24 operating budget. Uh, second. second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. okay, 7.16, new stadium scorecard. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, seeking approval tonight for a contract between uh, Dectronics and Queens County Public Schools to purchase a new scoreboard for the stadium at Ken Allen High School. Um, we'll be utilizing the Sourcewell Cooperative Purchasing Contract 050819 uh, DAC, and Dectronics um, will provide a new scoreboard, uh, will include freight and delivery. And the cost for that is $29,325. And this is actually coming from a fund that was created when um, Ken Island High School opened up. Um, and it's just oh. accumulated interest over the time. And they, uh, Mr. Ken and Mr. Harding were trying to think of something they could do that would benefit a majority of the students um, and, and spend some of that money on that project. We do have some local companies that are going to help us install that. Um, but this is a straight change out. We're not going to have to move anything. It's going to line up with the poles and all that to keep the cost down. Mm, and only thirteen fifty for shipping and handling. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> yeah. It's only 1%. All right. I noticed that. I did calculate that. <laughs> right. Mr. President, I move that we approve the contract between the Board of Education and Dectronics in the amount of $29,325 to replace the stadium scoreboard at Kent Island High School. And the budget source is a Kent Island High School funds that were donated. Okay. Second. All right, motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, 7.17, communications, Hello. electronics. Yes, 
sir. Seeking approval tonight uh, with a contract with Communication Electronics to purchase 100 Motorola SL300 portable two-way radios. Um, we'll be utilizing the Sourcewell Cooperative Purchasing Contract. Um, these two-way radios we have tried um, at Sellersville Middle School, and we've had a lot of success there. Um, we're seeking the amount of 43500 and this will be coming out of the restricted school safety fund. And if you're wondering why we've kind of selected these, a lot of the schools each year buy a cheaper brand, and they, they simply just don't work, or they may work for a few years. But Mr. Sabori um, put a lot of research into this, and basically we can have a communication from here out to Queen Anne's County High School still on the radio. And part of the other, if we can standardize the radios, we're putting each school on a different channel. So when, um, you know, they have to transport to another school, we're not handing out other radios. We can simply just go switch the channel, communicate with that school in case there's an emergency. Um, so our goal is to replace the ones that the administration have and the SROs have at each school with these so that, you know, the channels are already located and it's a much safer um, way to go with this. Many the questions. Biggest, the biggest thing is we don't have to worry about connectivity with this. Mm -hmm. yep. So this is an, you know, an yep. immediate way in an emergency situation um, to access um, help and not be in a situation where we'd have to default to a cell phone or mm -hmm. connectivity concerns that we have throughout the district. So they really are yeah. God sent yeah. in sure. schools, to be honest yeah. with you. Well, we've and, talked about that. Remember when they said that in some emergencies, because parents and kids are, are, are taxing our internet and mm -hmm. when, when, when something's going down that we right. may not This be really is to, the best. Yeah. And these it's, are excellent radios and that will last us a long time and, and really serve our schools we were well. Able to, I get them at a really good price too. So. Are we able to donate the other ones and we'll see. get anything for it? <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Mr. President, I move that we approve the contract with Communications Electronics to purchase 100 Motorola SL300 portable two-way radios in the amount of $43,500, and it is from fiscal, no, restricted school safety fund. Second. All right, motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, We're thanks guys. Good. I appreciate Thank everything. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Brings us to citizen participation. Anybody here for public comment? One more. All right. I like how she raised her hand. Oh, <laughs> forever. <laughs> so first let me say that it's been a pleasure to stay all night and hear all the wonderful things that are happening in the school system. So I, I'm here to make this last comment about a finer point in policy, the revisions policy 607, but I do want to say that it's been lovely to hear all the wonderful things that are happening. Um, the finer point to the revisions policy 607, as I said in my comments at the beginning of the meeting, I understood that, that those revisions were in response to Comar 13A and the change in that language. However, 13A as it exists right now includes cultural uh, responsiveness and cultural competency as part of the equity lens that 13A represents. And the current language in the QACPS proposed revised policy strips out culture um, as part of the equity piece that it's talking about. So I have stayed all night <laughs> to respectfully request that revisions are made to this revised document to um, reintroduce cultural responsiveness or cultural competency into that piece to more fully represent the equity lens that Comar 13A calls for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, no one else? Future meetings and events, uh, we'll have our next uh, work session April 19th, 2023 at 5 p.m. And that'll be followed by May 3rd meeting at 6 p.m. open session. Well, can I bring up one thing? Um, I don't know how, how this gets brought up, but on RFP for legal, we've had our attorney, which has been very helpful for five years. But I'm just, and it, I think it was a three-year contract re renewed every year or something. Um, would it be appropriate to send that out for an RFP? Absolutely. Uh, to see what to see what we've come to find out. I think that might sure. be appropriate. Sure. Diligent. Uh, Mrs. Towers and her team can absolutely do that for the board. I'll take care of that. Um, can I bring up one more new piece of business? Can we also ha have um, get
get an update for our audit, our energy audit? Sure, absolutely. Is, is, synergistic. Is it time yet? The synergistic. It, synergistic. Yeah. It, yeah. We just I mean, we can come in. We you can we can introduce the gentleman and all. Yeah. I mean, they're still yeah. putting together a lot. Nothing big. He just, he yeah. just started last Monday. Oh, then let's go. And um, so he's just getting on board and kind of feeling his way. But you know, in a month from now, we yeah. certainly can bring him to the board at least introduce meetings. some, so you can see him and know you know the familiarity uh, that he'll be in the schools and such. So, um, but we're guy? happy to it actually, see the new guys at the. Uh, no. Oh, next no. week. Okay. Oh, no. That's a, he, he's a maintenance person. That was oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, but but Bring no, we're right. happy to do that. Yeah. Um, certainly, certainly. Let's maybe put it on June for a yeah. full update yeah. of yeah. synergistics and an yeah. introduction and such. That's a good time. Mm -hmm. Where did you put the dates out for next school year for the board oh, yes. meeting dates? Are we supposed I to address those? That's just for everybody to review, and then we can circle back into next. Okay. okay, that's fine. That's yeah, because I did have a recommendation that July 5th is kind of yeah. usually during the week. We might want to push it to the next sure. week. So that's going to be up to the board. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Let everybody have a copy. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Business, so Second. Second.